session. And we are resuming our meeting, Public Accounts Committee. We had a brief <coughs> discussion in private session, and um, we will summarise in public session the issues that were raised without going into the details, because there's no mystery. It was substantially connected with our work programme. So um, the next item on the agenda is minutes. the minutes of the meeting of the 25th of September. Are they agreed? Agreed. agreed. It's agreed. So the next item on the agenda um, um, also corresponds with 1610B was circulated yesterday. Um, it's from the Department of Health about the implementation of the Scallery Report. We'll come to that. In, we'll discuss that issue in a work programme or timing of that issue, uh, but we can note and publish that now. Um, so matters arising, I don't think there's anything arising that won't come up in the course of our meeting. So the next item is correspondence. Three categories of correspondence. Category A, briefing documents and opening statements, reference number 1598 and 1608 um, from Chagas, uh, including the briefing document and opening um, statement, so we'll note and publish this. The next item of correspondence is Category B, from Accounting Officers and our Ministers are in follow-up of previous PAC meeting. We held over a number of items from last week's meeting, and we're waiting further information in relation to these, so we can still um, hold over some of these, I think, for the meantime. Um, so the first item that was held over was from Robert Watt, um, in relation to Dublin Institute of Technology, um, at our meeting last week, we agreed to note and publish this and request the CNAG's views regarding the relevant legislation. That letter has been sent, so that has been published. Um, 1468B and correspondence 1566 stated the 12th of September from Sean of Falou, uh, providing a copy of the review in relation to Kildare Wicklow ETB. The update is that we agreed to note and publish this correspondence and the Secretariat is working on isolating matters in the report that are not subject to a guard investigation so that we can look at the matter. So that's an update. Um, held over from the last day was 1490 from Stephen Blake covering government accounting units in deeper, in closing a minute from um, the Minister of Finance in relation to our previous uh, periodic report published last uh, January. I'm proposing that we hold that over. There's two or three of those, and that's something we'll take maybe a half an hour discussion on each of those reports. I've had a look at it, and um, you know I have mixed views on the quality of the response I received, but we'll come back to it in public session at another date. Next item held over from the last day was 1502 from Fergal Costello, the Department of Rural and Community Affairs, dated the 31st of July, uh, in relation to providing the statutory review of the Dormant Accounts Fund. And we agreed to publish a note that last time, and a number of items related to our periodic reports, so this can be included as an item on our future work programme. Next, the Dormant Accounts Fund. Dormant Accounts. Yeah. yeah we will come back to this. Great. On a great, because I really, I really have attempted to come to terms with it, and I, I just have failed. Yeah. So I, I need help here yeah. in relation to this matter. We need to look at this and what's happening. 50%, I think, approximately is underspent. Is it or is it more? That's right. Yeah. Might. And we have organisations struggling on the ground for money. Yeah. Absolutely struggling yeah. and we have I think it's fifty percent underspent. Some departments are much Under, higher underspent. Underspent. Yeah. And some, some departments are much higher than other departments. Um, I have tried, I've tabled all questions like other TDs, I'm sure, but I, I'm utterly failing to grasp, yeah. grasp this, this, despite our, 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 the effort on our part was to get the review. And now that we've got the review we need to look at it and we need to decide is there value for money here at all? What's happening? I think when they were here without a detail, we will come back to this, but I say last year, in all of last year, it was one of the, I use the word, is one of the most pathetic meetings I was at in terms of commitment to be given to concepts that somebody might do a project. There wasn't a sheet of paper, it's only a concept. Projects never happen. Money was locked up in a concept that had passed its sell by date. It had moved from one department, the Dormant Accounts Fund, to another department, to another department. It ended up being nobody's child and nobody wanted to take responsibility. And all the while, um, money had been committed. And because there had been no sunset clause, money was locked up. 
that should be used by the Dormant Account Fund. It's the worst thing I've seen in quite a while in terms of administration of scarce public resources um, and, and that money, and we will come back to that in our work programme. There was a lack of preparedness was the main factor causing yeah. the underspend, in addition to uh, low levels of uptake, which ranged, I think, from up in 90% yeah. down In to some departments. Some departments. Now. Well, lack of yeah. preparedness means yeah. a proposal was submitted and there was no detail behind it. As I use the word, there were only concepts, yeah. notions. Somebody had a, a notion we'd spend two million on this concept and it was approved in the money search side and nothing ever happened and that money is not Whatever about notions, there's yeah. a huge demand on the ground there is. for money. That's the sad bit. Yeah. That's yeah. So we yeah. will definitely come back to that and we will certainly be highlighting it in a, in a PAC report at Dormant Account Fund. But that um, report we've received will help us in coming to our conclusions. Okay. So next item held over from the last day, 1510 from Robert Watt. Um, in closing, a minute from the Minister of Finance in relation to a further periodic report. We hold that over again. Held over from the last day, 1513 from Kieran Breen, Director of State Claims Agency, providing further details um, requested by the Committee in relation to the status of non screening cervical misdiagnosis claims. Um, uh, we agreed to note and publish and hold it over for, pub for, for discussion. And we will discuss that issue the State Claims Agency and Cervical Check in a work programme in a few moments. Uh, correspondence held over from the last time, 1526, 1528 and 1530 from Raymond Mitchell uh, of the HSC providing follow-up information um, to issues requested at our meeting on the 5th of July. And there is a considerable amount of information and we'll hold over um, you know, signing. We've noted and published it, but we will come back to it as part of our work program. There's very extensive and comprehensive information in that, um, and there's so much it will take us an hour to go through it. So, when we're coming back to those issues, that correspondence will be part of our work program. Held over from the last meeting, 1538 from Ray Mitchell, uh, HSE again, uh, providing follow up information following our meeting on the 14th of June. Uh, very extensive documentation submitted, and we'll hold that. We'll no, it has been noted and published, but we will have that on file as part of our work programme. Next item held over from the last meeting, 1560, uh, from Barry O'Connor, uh, Cork Institute, providing a detailed note requested by the committee in relation to the preparation of terms of reference at the KPMG review of an anonymous allegations against CIET in 2014. Uh, we agreed to note and publish this, and we will be holding it over, so we're coming back to that. But just confirming that has been published. Correspondence 1561 from Anne Hessian on the Higher Education Authority in relation to the examination of expenditure associated with the retirement of the former president of CIT and a note on the ability of technology universities to borrow. Um, after last week's meeting, we did note and discuss it and we read it into the public record, but that will form part of our ongoing work, that, that memo, which was the only little bit of positive information I saw on that whole topic so far. Next item 1599 from Michael Crow, Corporate Communications Manager, NTMA, dated 27th of September providing um, information to the committee in relation to the preparation of our next periodic report. Uh, we'll note and publish this, 1599 uh, from Michelle Lowe, uh, NTMA, that was received from the last meeting. So we are continuing our work on the periodic reports and the Secretariat have been going through the transcripts and they're following up with various bodies questions that hadn't been fully answered and that's part of that process and we'll just note and publish that in the meantime. But it will come back to us when we're finalising our periodic report. Next item 1600 um, from Margaret Fitzgerald, Private Secretary to the Department of Finance. Um, the Secretariat requested an update in relation to the review of staffing governance and operations of the Tax Appeals Commission and the Department advised a copy of this review is expected to be issued to the PAC in the next week or so. It has been completed it's on the Minister's desk and we're told we'll have it in a week or so. So we look forward to um, receiving that and hopefully we'll have it very shortly. Next item, we note and publish that. Next item, correspondence C from private individuals and other correspondents. First one is 1491 from Mark Griffin, Department of Communications, Climate Action and Environment, dated the 19th of July, enclosing an information note as requested regarding what appears to be a far from complete remediation of a landfill site in um, in County Wicklow. At our meeting, we agreed to note and publish the correspondence and hold it over for 
further discussion. In the meantime, we've received further correspondence from the original correspondence and we'll return to it as part of our work programme. Held over from the last meeting also was 1572, um, dated 15th of September, related to the previous item, so I've just referred to that. So we will. Um, um, send, so at our last meeting we agreed to send a response from the department um, to the correspondence. We received further documentation from him and we will, can return to that. Um, we may return to that as part of, part of our future work programme. Held over from the last meeting 1578 from an individual um, dated the 14th of September requesting the committee to make recommendations to the government regarding the accountability and management of the state property assets. The matter relates to the forthcoming CNAG report and refers to issues raised with the previous committee. We agreed to note and publish and we, we agreed to note and publish and hold it over for further discussion. Is that the item we discussed in private? Yeah. So um, I don't think we agreed to publish it the last day. I think the last day we agreed to hold it over. But we've discussed this item um, Deputy Kelly it'll be part of our and this is one of the items we've discussed in private yeah. session. Yeah. So yeah. just to summarise where we're going with this letter. Well, this is a fairly significant letter in relation to the OPW from a former valuer who worked in the OPW. Um, and as I said in the private session, I have spoken and met with the individual. Um, I believe the very serious issues that he has um, brought forward in this letter. We're meeting with the OPW next week. Um, I believe we should proceed with our meeting with the OPW next week and go through all the various different issues, particularly those highlighted, obviously, by the CNAG. And further to that, um, at a later date, we as a committee should meet with this individual. Uh, we'll take advice, whether that's public or private, potentially private, um, to go through his correspondence and his backup documentation, some of which I've seen uh, in relation to this, um, in relation to what he's brought forward. Very, very serious, serious issues being brought forward by this individual who's just retired from the OPW as their most senior valuer. Just, uh, I read the letter yeah. and I agree that there are very significant issues raised in the letter. I think it should be brought to the attention of the Office of Public Works. I think they should have a chance to look at that so that they're in a position to deal with questions raised. And if there's a report or anything that we should have prior to the meeting, there's a report uh, referred to here. Uh, inquiries should be made about that. Yeah. So, <clears throat> we'll forward this letter to the OPW. Uh, we discussed it in private session. There might be a few words we will redact because of the parliamentary privilege issue, um, but the substance of the, the letter, by and large, will be published uh, during the course of the day on, by the PAC, subject to minor redactions. And we will send it then to the OPW and ask them whatever report is referred but to, that will be sent Just to, to concur with, Dr. with Deputy Conley, there is a report referred to in here that was compiled by this individual with another individual who still remains employed in the OPW. Uh, that report has, is with the chairperson of the OPW. As I understand it, there has been no reply to that report. So we may want to ask in advance of next week, chair of the OPW, for this report to be sent to the committee yeah. and also um, for his reply that he sent back to the individuals who wrote it, if one exists. Okay. So. We have that. We'll ask the Secretary to communicate that to the OPW in advance of next week's meeting. And we're conscious there's a CNAG chapter in relation to a particular matter dealing with the OPW and the Department of Health in his report. And we'll come to our work programme shortly. So the next item is 1595 from an individual dated 22nd of September highlighting matters um, regarding the appointment of Capital Projects Manager in Our Ladies Hospital in Harris Cross. I propose we note the item and members are free to address it as part of a future work programme with the HSE. It's a state funded, I think it's a section 38 organisation, or 38. So we will come back to that um, issue and we'll hold it over. You know, I think it can form part of our work programme with the HSC. Next item 1602 from an individual date of 25th of September regarding pension arrangements and the President. We will note and no debate. Uh, item 1607 from Deputy Bobby Aylward, dated the 1st of October, requesting the committee to examine the operation, financial arrangements and oversight of the school transport service. I report, propose we'll include this on our work programme. Do Deputy Aylward want yeah, to comment at this stage? I understand there was a report done, but they were never brought in as witnesses, whether they the, 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 the post or the department. They were never brought in front of the, the PAC here. 
Okay. Were they, were they brought in here before, Mr. Or are they? Mr. No, McCarty, they, fill us in on the background, I think. Yeah, well, I, I did a, a special report on the um, provision of school transport. Um, it it re addresses uh, uh, responsibilities of the department. Bus air in per se isn't uh, answerable to the committee. Um, yeah. So I, I'm not sure quite how you would deal when with that. When was that report done? Uh, the report was published or was presented on the 25th of October. So what year? Last year. Uh, who re who requested that report? 17. Who requested that report? I, I decided to do you that. You decided yourself. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, I, I think it may just have been overlooked in the crush of other um, so issues last as, year. As a report to us within the last year, yes. one item that the PAC just hasn't got to yet. That's but correct. you have done a report that we I have, have a report, to. yeah. Well, it's clear cut. That's right, that's this, you know, because at yeah. this time of year especially, you know, the problems we're having out there, and just, yeah. I think there's 350 children uh, around the country are on concession tickets that have been left on the side of the road. Right. And uh, that's my concern. I have a particular concern in my own uh, area, my own constituency, my own parish, yeah. where 11 children have been left behind. And uh, that's why I raise this matter, and I think uh, it raises its head at this time of year. I'm just wondering, is the, the, the rollout of the system in, that's in place now is, good, is fit for purpose and doesn't need to be reviewed, and maybe that's what we should look at here uh, on your report, the Control of Children's report. We should look at this and see if we get value for money as well. Okay, we will start, if there's a CNAG report on it since last year, we have to look at it as far as I'm and concerned. I think given the elapse of time, it may be useful to get the um, department to update. update the key measures uh, in the report, if they can. Right, so when we're setting a date, we'll ask for an, yeah, when we come to a work programme, and we'll set a date as soon as practical to deal with that. Will that be it, or will it be we'll come to the work programme in a few minutes, right? Okay, so. Yeah, so the, but it certainly has to be on a work programme, right? Um, and we'll, come, we'll have a discussion on that now in a few minutes. Now, the next item then is statements and accounts received, and this is going to take a few minutes, because um, since July, um, 101 uh, statements of accounts have been submitted to this committee. We normally every week know 10 or 20 but due to the summer period, you'll have to bear with me for a period. I'll move as fast as I can. Now, it doesn't sound bad. There's really 70 um, financial statements, and the CNAG's report, which has, seven, has 40 votes for each of the state bodies, so that's one composite document. But there are about 70, and if some people have issues, we can just hold over particular ones for a later date. Um, but we'll try and move as fast as we can. Um, we'll give it a few minutes and then we'll come back to our work programme before we go into public session. So, I'm moving on straight away. These have all been received um, since over the summer period. Um, the first one is the Personal Injuries Assessment Board, clear audited opinion. Um, they assess compensation entitlements in personal injury cases. The next item is Enterprise Ireland. Clear audit opinion, attention is drawn to expenditure where procurement procedures did not comply with public procurement guidelines. I suspect it won't be the only public body you'll have that remark on. So I'm marking that. Enterprise Ireland, 350 million their annual turnover. Next item, 4.3 calls SOLAS, um, funding of 603 million and they plan and coordinate further education and training. Again, there's issues of non-procurement with public... Yeah. Um, 603 million is their, their turnover. I know, but what is the... The, the attention is drawn to instances of non-compliance with public procurement guidelines. I, I don't have the, um, the specific figures here, but I think in general the figures are around between half a million and maybe okay. two million. Some of them would be more uh, th than that. But and, and is that, are they the full amount or sampled amount, or samples? The HSE is only a sample. Yeah, in the HSE, yeah, and it, it's difficult to extrapolate in the HSE because of the way their, their systems are, are organised. Are not um, organised. Increase are not organised. Um, increasingly, um, we have been seeing organisations do full surveys of all their procurement and they're self-declaring um, uh, the extent of, of non-compliance. So th there, there's a mix there in, in some situations, um, but it's becoming fewer and fewer. Uh, we're reporting a sample figure. Yeah. Uh, in other cases, uh, it's their survey of all their uh, procurements. Okay, on the procurement, it goes without saying that's 100% what we're meant to be looking at, non-procurement, and there's so many instances of it. We'll come back, but we'd probably like a summary of all the accounts brought to us here on a, on a spreadsheet of all the bodies that had procurement issues, and I think it's an issue we have to deal with, because um, we can't just 
be hopping on it every week and never do anything about it. So it's a bit like getting organisations their financial reporting up to date. We've made great progress in that in the last year or two. I think we have to move now on a topic like this, as well as everything else we have to do. Okay, next item, Chagas. They're in this afternoon. They're in very shortly. Um, um, they're the Agri Agriculture and Food Development Authority. Again, there's a clear order of opinion, but attention is drawn to expenditure where uh, public procurement procedures were not fully complied with. Next item, Board Nagan, clear order of opinion. Kingdom Greyhound Racing um, Company Limited, clear order of opinion. Obviously, we're dealing with a lot of subsidiaries, subsidiaries of Board Nagan, a different Greyhound racetrack. Cork Greyhound Racing Company Limited, clear account. Clamel Racing Company Limited, um, clear order of opinion. The Limerick Greyhound Racing Track, clear order of opinion. Um, Abergrove Limited, they are Board Nagan's Food and Beverages Operations, separate company, clear audit opinion. Galway Greyhound Stadium Limited, clear audit opinion. Dublin Greyhound and Sports Association Limited, um, clear audit opinion. This company ceased trading in February 2017. An agreement was reached for the sale of the premises, Harles Cross Stadium, um, for 23 million, which is sufficient to allow the company to discharge its residual liabilities. Very coincidental. And I think it's the result of the Department of Education. I think people in Dublin will be more familiar with that. So, so anyway, we, we, we note that, and we note. Has, the has it been, will there be a 2018 certificate counts for that organisation? There will be. So there will be a final set, will there? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, next item, Shelburne Greyhound Stadium Limited Clear Audit Opinion, Waterford Greyhound Race Company 1953 Limited Clear Audit Opinion, Yall Greyhound Race Company Clear Audit Opinion, National Isle Reserve Agency, it ensures that Ireland meets its obligation to maintain minimum stocks of oil, Clear Audit Opinion, Western Development Commission Clear Audit Opinion, Digital Hub Agency provides a collaborative space for individuals to create digital media products and services. That's Dublin, isn't it? Correct. City Centre, Smithfield. Clear Audit Opinion. Next item, Pensions Authority. Clear Audit Opinion. Telefish Nagelga. Clear Audit Opinion. Sustainable Energy Authority Ireland. Clear Audit Opinion. Irish Auditing and Accounting Supervisory Authority. Clear Audit Opinion. National Transport Authority. Uh, clear Audit Opinion. Microfinance Ireland. Uh, clear Audit Opinion. NSCDA operations that they are involved in developing and running and operating the National Sports Campus, campus Clear Audit Opinion, the National Asset Management Agency, Clear Audit Opinion, and then there's a number of subsidiaries of NAMA, National Asset Management DAC, Clear Audit Opinion, National Asset Loan Management DAC, Clear Audit Opinion, National Asset Management Group Services DAC, Clear Audit Opinion, National Asset JVA DAC, Clear Audit Opinion, National Asset Residential Property Property DAC, Clear Audit Opinion, um, National Asset Property Management DAC, Clear Audit Opinion, National Asset North Keys DAC, Clear Audit Opinion, National Asset Management Services DAC, Clear Audit Opinion, and National Asset um, Zaratoza Limited, Clear Audit Opinion. That's a subsidiary in the USA. So they've all Clear Audit Opinion, and we've had, we actually had a very recent meeting with NAMA and they covered all those subsidiaries. Our next item is public trustee account. This, the public trustee administers 148 trusts relating to the Department of Agricultural Activities involving former Land Commission trust balances. There's only a figure of €38,000, so it's really a sheet of paper, a clear audit opinion. There's no actual current transactions there. Uh, finance accounts, uh, the annual statement of transactions to the central fund, um, they were, they, they were lodged on the 18th of July. That's a small matter of 53.6 billion, which deals with the full uh, income and receipts from the state. Clear audit opinion, but obviously that's an issue we, we will be returning to. Local government fund 2017, uh, 1.9 billion. Finance is part of the expenditure of local authorities. Clear audit opinion. I think we'll be dealing with that as part of the, the department. Credit Institutions Resolution Fund, a clear audit opinion, there is only turnover of 8.3 million. Um, next item, State Property Miscellaneous Deposits Account, 14 million in, in account. As for the collection of windfall receipts, for example, uh, residual property remaining where a company are, is dissolved or struck off. Um, we discussed this before about, I raised this before about where company was dissolved people left, gone, but there is actually a residual asset. Nobody was able to tell me that there's a state account that actually deals with that. There was, everyone was vague as to where this money ended up. It's the Department of Finance, I take it, somewhere. Is it, I is think it's under power. 
entire public okay. expenditure. I'm going to ask the Secretariat to, uh, more out of curiosity because this well, came up. The circulator copy those yeah. accounts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and, these, uh, and people can look at them if they want. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that's my recollection. Yeah. Yeah, because we didn't ask. I, I, I gave I you a note last year about a number of yeah. these uh, unusual accounts, um, uh, which uh, the Secretariat will have. They could maybe circulate it again. But then. Um, and does people who die in test state, does that go in here as well? Uh, I, uh, yes, I, I, or it could be some free monies. Um, can you remember? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's explained in that note that in, I in um, that note. So that note. I don't just have So effectively, it. we started the conversation on people who died in test state where the money went, and this is really where companies are in test state. They're gone, and nobody left to claim them. So this is the corporate version of the... Does that money be going for use for charity purposes or what? It's money that is um, collectible or, or receivable into the central fund of the Exchequer. So it goes into forms one fund. And in theory, oh, that, uh, not in theory. In, in the law is from we discussed this last year. I think if somebody can come back within, I think it could be up to a 25-year period to to prove that they are the one remaining shareholder and they've been in Australia and they're now back <coughs> and they realise that the building that they had the company had has been sold, they can actually, I think, claim it back. It's a bit like the dormant account funds, if, if you can, but there's probably very little of that. But in theory, that option is there. So that's why they hold money in an account in the event that somebody someday might show up. OK? Anyway, we learn something new every day. Next item, um, Ireland United States Educational Fund. It collects funds for the Ireland United States Commission for Education Exchange. Um, a clear audit opinion is €7,000 of the transaction, so a small amount. Um, the next item is Health Products Regulatory Authority. Um, it's clear audit opinion and a, the costs of superannuation entitlements accounted for as they become payable rather than in, in the year of entitlement. So um, that happens in all the health organisations. It's not proper accounting for pensions and the CNAG highlights that there. Chairman, Resident, sorry, yeah. I, I think um, that, that's actually a qualified uh, audit oh, opinion qualified in, opinion. in respect of that point okay. of how they're dealing with the uh, accounting for pension liabilities. Right. It's a qualified audit because of that particular yeah, issue. Absolutely. Just on that point. Thank you. Residential Institution Statutory Fund Board, Karen Nua. Clear audit opinion, but attention is drawn to ongoing weakness in the board's control and over grant payment. I'll ask the secretary just again on that because that has come up before to circulate those financial statements to the committee yeah, and people. Just, just to note as well there that that's the 2016 financial statements. Oh, so there, there's delay there as well. In and the, have you received the 2017? We would yeah. have received them. I don't believe they've been signed yet. On, yeah, the audit is ongoing. It's on, ongoing, uh, the 17. For so 17. They're, so yeah. they're a bit behind. But we'll circulate those to committee members because somebody might want to have a, a closer look at them. Next. Yeah. They shouldn't be behind. Yeah. It's a very, very specific purpose set up for a specific pu function. They shouldn't be behind. It's been mired in difficulty from day one. And is there an avenue for us to come back to that? Can't We've be. had serious issues now in relation to no chair. Uh, the monitoring, governance, uh, renting of a building in a limited fund, and we know from last week that the total amount still hasn't been paid over right. of the 105 million or whatever it was. Agreed. Three or four million still to be still paid. outstanding. Yeah, but okay. that's that's not the current news fault, but that that's still outstanding. Yeah. So I, I certainly have never been happy with this in terms of governance. But more importantly, the people on the ground who were availing of the service, you know well they've raised serious difficult issues in relation to this matter. So is there an avenue to come back to this? There is, because it's ordered by the CNAG, it's under the remission of this committee, that's why the account is here. So it's certainly. So, so when will the 17 accounts be ready and be come before us? The, the audit is ongoing. Um, I, I don't have um, a, a date. completion. Maybe date next yet. week you might yeah, give us an estimate. With that. An yeah. estimate for next Garmont, week. You might give us an estimate yeah. and we might schedule a meeting after we see the 17 accounts. Okay? Thanks. But it's definitely within the remit of this committee. Everything I'm mentioning here is within the remit of this committee. Next item, TUSLA, the Child and Family Agency. They have a clear audit opinion, but attention is drawn to expenditure and goods and services that were not procured by way of a competitive process and weaknesses in the agencies and oversight of grants to outside agencies. So um, that's an issue we will take up. The HSE 
um, had some of those issues in relation to monitoring grants to outside agencies and seem to have improved their system. So Tuesla need to now do the same. So that's an issue. We might be coming back to that department, you know, as part of our work programme, and we can look at Tuesla specifically. Next item: National Disability Authority. Um, it's a clear audit opinion. Next item is National Cancer Registry Board. It collects and classifies information on all cancer cases which occur in Ireland. Qualified audit opinion, but cost of superannuation entitlements um, accounted for as they become payable rather than in the year of entitlement. So that was not a clear audit opinion. It was qualified audit opinion because they don't adequately or properly account for the pension costs. Next item, Health Insurance Authority, regulator of private health insurance market and administers the risky equalisation fund and the next topic at certificate accounts is the risk equalisation fund itself. So you have the fund which is an audit of 673 million and then you have the health insurance authority which regulates it and the risk equalisation fund in case people are wondering what it is, it's say where um, some of the company de depending on the age mix and profile of customers of the three private health insurers that are in the market. The VHI probably has older people, so there is a transfer of fund approved by the Health Insurance Authority um, from the LEA Insurance, and I forget the name of the other one just offhand, somebody will remember it, uh, which can go to the VHI as a to equalise the risk across the industry, in other words. So, and there's a lot of money moves from one to the other. 600, it's very substantial, the amount of money that moves from one of the companies to another. But it's in an effort to have a, a, a fair market for everybody in the country, rather than pe companies just being allowed to cherry pick the pieces they want. So the principle, I think, is a good one. Anyway. Aside from that, next item, Food Safety Authority of Ireland, a clear audited opinion and cost of superannuation entitlements accounted for as they become payable rather than the year of entitlements. The same issue again. And you might explain, why did they get a clear audit opinion even though they're the same issue? Uh, that's it that's should qualified. Be qualified. Okay, and it's a typo here. So yes. it's qualified. We just, we're, we're alert. As we're correcting one. We're alert, other. right? <laughs> one all. <laughs> one all. <laughs> oh, <wait. laughs> right? Next item, Dublin Institute of Advanced Studies Clear Audit Opinion, Lout Mead Education Training Board, 2016. Here we go again with this organisation. Um, clear Audit Opinion, but attention is drawn to non compliance with national procurement guidelines and delays in finalising the financial statement for 16 due to changes in senior personnel, restructuring of the organisation, and knock on impact. Um, from the delays in 2015. How are the fix for 17? Or do you know yet? Uh, it's not completed yet, but uh, yeah, the audit the next is not day, going. They're yeah, they, they are making progress. Yeah. Um, yeah. You might just, on any of the ones that are old that we asked for, just give us a note for the next day. Just a comment as to where they are. Next item, here's another one that's always in trouble with getting their accounts in on time. National College of Art and Design. Clear audit opinion, but attention is drawn to um, um, procurement issues. A number of governance issues. The college was not in full compliance with the code of practice of governance of state bodies. The board's decision to discontinue a human resource management project resulting in a waste of public money of 138,000, and the recognition of a deferred pension funding asset of 87 million, uh, as the normal one that applies to universities and third level. So I think we'll write to the National College of Art and Design to explain the issue of why they discontinued the project that they had spent 138 million and there was no. So um, there is no benefit um, to the organisation or the public for that, and also to deal with the governance issues where they weren't compliant with the code of practice for the government's state body. So we'll ask for a specific note from the organisation to explain that. And when are the 17 accounts gone into you yet? Uh, they are, uh, yeah. and uh, audit is ongoing there they're, as well. Moving, yeah. right. they, they've made a lot of progress. They, they, they and, have. Uh, I think 2015, uh, 2016 was the year where they really, uh, the systems began to kick in. So I would expect for 16, 17 that there'll be much less comment uh, in relation to control. They're getting there. Matters. Okay, next item, Education and Research Centre, clear audit opinion. Um, Deferred pension assets is uh, noted again, and the board did not carry out a review of the effectiveness of systems of internal control, which will be noted in the in the set of financial statements. Next item: Higher Education Authority, statutory funding body for higher, you know, 1.2 billion, and they're on our work program, and we'll be dealing with that shortly. A clear audit opinion. Next time, next one: Old School Nahir and Galiv, uh, the 2017 accounts, clear audit opinion, but recognition is drawn to the deferred pension asset, like in all. 
national universities, payments where uh, procurement procedures implied did not comply with public procurement guidelines and omissions of a disclosure about a severance of a payment of 91,000 to a staff member in respect of a period of non-attendance and treated incorrectly as sabbatical leave. I think we'll write and ask for a note in connection with it. Deputy yeah. to the maybe I, I'd like just cl clarity from the controller and auditor general on that. Was that something that was done inadvertently? That it was the omission from a disclosure that it was a severance payment rather than a person on sabbatical leave? Just the, just just to put that in context. For well, me, it, it was a matter uh, that we discussed with them. We felt the figure should have been included. They took a different view. Okay, well, just on what basis did they take? Sorry, it seems to be a very practical matter. Somebody's yeah. either getting a severance payment or they're not. Or um, they, their view was that this was not part of a severance payment. Our view was that it should have been comprehended in the severance payment. And did they agree with you then? No, no they didn't. No, they didn't. So that's, that's why I'm drawing attention highlighted. to it. Yeah. So they stuck to their guns and the CNAG had it, and the CNAG is highlighting the fact that he has a different opinion. Yeah. Just the material and the, the, an amount has been disclosed and uh, we drew their attention to uh, the, uh, our view that it should be a bigger disclosure, a bigger figure. Okay. Uh, and when they chose not to do it, I, I chose to draw attention to it. And just, does that beg the question, are there other situations like this where this is happening? Um, there is a report uh, which is with the department at the moment which refers to another situation which is similar. Uh, I prefer not to okay. mention but it, but same, you, you'll, shortly, you'll shortly have detail of it and you will understand why in this circumstance I felt it was appropriate to draw attention to this one as well. So just, to be, just we're talking about the same university? We're talking about yeah. a different, so or, a, a different a, uh, institution. Well, a different institution? Yes, but an education sector institution. Okay. And when will that report? That's, that's it's with the department. Okay. It should be, I, I would expect, in the next, this month uh, at some time. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, thank you. So the next one then is. To them in relation yeah, to I think we'll write yeah. again just them to restate their view so we can consider it formally yeah, here in relation to that payment and also um, they didn't comply with procurement guidelines. Okay, and we'll ask them just to put on record here um, the reasons why. So the next item is Longford and Westmead Education and Training Board. And there's material non compliance with national procurement. It's a clear audit opinion. Kevin Monaghan, Education Training Board, clear audit opinion, but statement of internal financial controls disclosed concerns regarding the internal audit resources available to the board. Um, I take all these together. Cork Education and Training Board, clear audit opinion, but again, material non compliance with government procurements and internal financial controls issues have been uh, highlighted by the CNAG and the Tipperary Education and Training Board, clear audit opinion, but again, there's a material level of non compliance with national procurement rules and concerns regarding the adequacy of internal audit resources. So there's one, two, there are four ETBs here. While they're getting their accounts in on time, they have problems. Yeah, and um, the, um, the the concern that the, a number of them are raising around the adequacy of internal audit uh, arrangements uh, has to do with uh, an, an unusual arrangement that's in place where there is um, an agency um, located, I think it's in Cavan Monaghan, mm. um, which provides internal audit services, which uh, became understaffed. And it has been addressed, but they all have a concern that there wasn't sufficient internal audit being done. Uh, in 2017. Yeah, it's up to the, that was up to kind of, um, yeah, that, that, that was last year's statement. So Last year's, yeah, during the period uh, covered by last yeah, year's when we're doing it, We might globally cover this issue rather than each one by one yeah, because it's yeah. the same point. It looks as if they had a kind of a centralised... That, that's uh, correct, it is centralised. Based in Cabin Monaghan, and, and yeah. if one had a problem, they all had a problem. Exactly. Okay, okay, gotcha. Okay, we're nearly there. Next item is, and this is something we've... Sorry, no, yeah. just on the non-procurement, and we've yeah. raised it repeatedly. But usually it's a, a um, non-procurement, but here our attention is drawn to a material level of non-compliance. Yeah. yeah. In, with the Cork Education and Training Board. It is. Yeah, I, it, uh, they're all material. They're, they're, they're all uh, material. They're, Tipperary is material. Yeah, if, if, if the uh, identified non-compliant expenditure is less than yeah. half a million euros, 
uh, we don't draw attention to it. But once it goes over that level of half a million, we regard that's our materiality threshold. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And this and be intended for appropriately. Sorry, I didn't comply. Didn't comply. Not compliant. Yeah. Did you put a figure? Is there a figure in their accounts as to how much it was in the notes? Generally, they are just closing that. So, yeah. in, the, yeah. in their accounts, which all of these are there, linked to the Oroctus Library, yeah. Yeah. by the way, are they're on the Oroctus. Yeah, so you can yeah. check the figure in any of your own ETVs yeah. here. They're published here and they're available through the Oroctus as well. Next item 2017 accounts. The National Paediatric Hospital Development Board, that's the Children's Hospital, so it's a qualified audit, audit opinion. The financial statements give a true and fair view, except that the cost of superannuation statements accounted for as they become uh, payable rather than provided for in advance. It's the same issue with all the health bodies. Next item, um, we have the Mayo Sligo, Mayo Sligo Leitrim ETB, again clear audit opinion, again weaknesses. Um, in producing delays in producing the financial statements, there was oh that's the 16 account. It is, yeah. So they had a very particular problem. You remember when yeah. uh, we discussed this previously? And uh, how they is had there, how very is considerable 17? difficulty getting 2015 accounts together. Um, but certainly uh, significant progress has been made um, and 2017 um, is, is underway. Is underway. Okay, again there was control weaknesses and again um, the Finance Committee met just once during the year and there was no review of the board's effectiveness of the systems of internal and financial control. And then Dundalk Institute of Technology, qualified auditor's opinion, the financial statements give a true and fair view except that there has been a um, the group income for 2015 has been materially overstated. Contrary to accounting standards, the Institute has recognised 812,000 that should be treated as a prior period adjustment as, as current income. The end of August 2016 financial position is not affected. Tension is drawn to non-recognition of pension costs and a material level of non-compliance. So that issue in relation to the 812 is probably an accounting issue as to whether it should have been in one year or another year. So it's in there now. It's in there now and the, the, the statement of financial position at the end of uh, 2016 correct. is correct. It's right now. Yeah. It, it's really a question of uh, where you recognise the, yeah, the income. In the account. Okay. So we'll come back to all of those separately. And then finally, the Commission for Aviation Regulation, a clear audit opinion. So that's, oh, sorry, there's two over the page, a couple over the page. Donegal Education and Training Board, um, clear audit opinion. Um, now we'll ask them, attention is drawn to a payment of 853,000 euro made to the Revenue Commissioners in 2017 in respect of the misclassification of a number of employees for PRSI purposes between 1997 and 2011. So we have to write to Donegal Education and Training Board. Obviously, um, you drew attention to this payment. And did that 853,000, was that interest and penalties, or was it, or would you know, have you a breakdown of that? Um, I don't have the breakdown here. Okay, but we're going to write to Donegal ETB for a full breakdown of that 853,000. And was it a settlement? It was a settlement. Settlement yeah. with the revenue. Yeah, the, effectively um, they had the wrong PRSI classification. Right. Um, and uh, it was uh, employer's PRSI that was underpaid as a result. Right. But I, 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 was it self-disclosure? Did that get um, published? I don't I don't, rem I don't recall that okay. it did. Um, yeah. We, 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 we'll ask for a full explanation of how that 850... 3,000 rows, how the figure was settled with the revenue yeah. and, and the lessons learned. Okay? And then on board Planola, clear auditor's opinion, and finally, the 2017 appropriation accounts published with the report of the accounts and the public service last Friday, um, which covers the appropriation accounts for 42 different government votes of expenditure. They all got clear auditor's opinion, but there's interesting chapters with commentary on at least half of them. So we'll come to them. That'll keep us busy for the year. So that's 101 financial statements noted, recorded, published, comments and some. So um, then the next item I want to deal with is our work programme. Okay, and we'll put the draft work programme. Today we're dealing with Chagas. And, and next week we're dealing with um, the OPW. And uh, we have said already, so as part of that work programme, we're sending that letter that we received from um, Alan, Alan Morgan, 
um, maybe with some redactions to them for comment, and that letter will be noted and published. So the OPW are in next week on that issue. We've already pre-arranged um, for the following week, the 18th, um, it is, is a deeper yeah, the public expenditure in relation to the 17 figures. We never got to do the 16, so we have to include them, but I'm sure 99% of the conversation will be on the most recent set of the figures, but we have to have them there for the record as well. And then then we want to move on um, just in relation to other issues. Um, the we that day as well, are we? Just to clarify. Yes, we're going to try and have the Higher Education Authority in on the afternoon of the 18th. And that's arising from the press statement by the HEA Chief Executive, Dr. Graham Love, that he's stepping down. And um, we have agreed in private session that we would invite uh, um, Dr. Love to attend to assist the committee um, in relation to the health area or the education area, but also for Michael Horgan, the chairman of the HEA, to attend that meeting, and also the Secretary General of the Department of Education to attend. So we've had the Secretary General of Education here uh, with the Chief Executive of the HEA before, but we also want, because they're in a transition arrangement in the HSE, uh, one Chief Executive retiring and obviously will be replaced in due course. It's important we have the Chairman of the Board here as part of that discussion as well. So that's agreed that we proceed and try and contact the people as quick as possible to put them on notice uh, in respect of that meeting. The other item that we mentioned, that's um, uh, in private session we agreed to have a private meeting, which I'm not getting into, is a person who has made a protected disclosure in the prison service and we're having a, a private meeting with that person in private session Before rather than in public. Stephen, Dr Love, are we absolutely certain that he will be still in situ on that date? No. We'll have to check it out. And if he's not in situ, we're going to have to bring it forward to another evening. In okay. Here. We'll ask the Secretary, hopefully by tomorrow, to have all that confirmed. Because I suspect he won't be around by that date, so we'll probably have to bring it forward to next okay. week. Okay. Well, we'll ask the Secretariat to check into that today and tomorrow and to email okay. all the members directly. Thank you. So we're up to speed straight away. You know, you're not. Next week, then. Uh, yeah. the well, let's see how they get on. Okay. Let's see how they, you know, we'll wait and see. But keep us informed by email, all the members of the committee. Uh, I said we're going to arrange a private session as soon as possible in relation to the person who's made a protected disclosure. And because it's a protected disclosure, we're dealing with it in private session. And then the other issue is we had a discussion in private session in relation to Gabriel Scali's report, and we agreed, um, um, I have the note in front of me, but essentially uh, we agreed that the, com yeah, the health committee have Dr Scali and the HSC in um, on the 10th of October, which is only next week. So the clerk of our committee will liaise with that committee in relation to any matters that arose that are of particular significance to the PAC in terms of contracts, contract management, procurement. Um, we'd also said that we will specifically be dealing with the state claims agency in relation to how all claims are being dealt with by mediation or court or whatever. We will need uh, a, an update on that as soon as possible. And then, um, you know, we'll get updates after the Health Committee. So that's essentially it. The Health Committee are doing work. There's a role for us, and we will ensure there's no unnecessary, no unnecessary duplication, but the work proceeds on that. So then, in relation to the work programme, um, I'm going to... The date for what we agreed in relation to the OPW uh, representative who was written to us. The, the letter, yeah, that will be done after the... Yeah, we'll maybe set a date after the next meeting. Yeah. And we'll see how we get on okay. next meeting. But in relation to just general ideas for the work programme, it's kind of... Um, we have agreed up to the, the 4th to the 10th, the 11th to the 10th, the 18th to the 10th, and very importantly, on the 25th of the 10th, we have, um, we're dealing with matters in relation to housing. So it's the Department of Housing, Plan and Local Government solely in connection with housing, and we had the note circulated. Um, um, we're going to, as part of that um, issue, we're going to bring in representatives, um, I think it's the Irish Council for Social Housing, they're the umbrella group, if I would call them that, for the hou approved housing bodies, because most of the funding is now being challenged through approved housing bodies. <clears throat> it's very clear the CNAG has reported on it. Um, there's no statutory regulation of housing bodies, and I think the CNAG said the department can't confirm how many houses the approved housing bodies actually built. So there's a laguna of information so there. Yes, yeah. I mean, you have the topic then is matters related to housing. That's a fairly broad 
uh, church in terms of the, I mean, we could spend, if we were, you said the Irish Council, it's the Secretary General of the Department coming on that day, yeah. he is, yeah. I mean, I know we've discussed here previously, we could do a whole day on HAP, yeah. you know, on value for money and in terms of, of the, the amount of money now being spent on housing assistance payment uh, on the last seven years in terms of acquisitions. Uh, I think there's nearly a billion has been spent by the local authorities on house acquisitions over the last seven years. So, I mean, are we going to structure the day in terms of different compartments? Or are we just because otherwise it could, we could go all over the, the place on that particular okay. day, Chairman? I would say it would be an extensive meeting. <coughs> so, we certainly need to have the Department and Secretary General and the key people in the housing section in the Department here. We certainly need to have um, somebody from the housing agency, the housing and sustainable community section. In so you're saying the housing bodies are coming in as well? Is no, it? What, no, what I would propose, the Irish Council for Social Housing, they are, am I right, Seamus, in saying they're kind of the umbrella? That's I understand it, yeah. 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 They're, they're obviously not within my remit. No, yeah. but the, the approved housing bodies, do you audit them? No. no. So these are private, private housing organs. We all know who the approved housing bodies are. But essentially, most government funding has been channeled through them for house construction and long-term leasing as opposed to the local authorities. Like, if they're not in the room or their representatives are not in the room, we have a major gap. And then the issue of, there's still up to a quarter of a million paid by the Department of Employment Affairs and Social Protection for rent supplement, not to mind the substantial amount of money being paid uh, under HAP payments. So they're all connected. So there'll be quite a bit, maybe we won't get it all done and done, but I'd hate to have a discussion here and not to have the approved housing body in the room because if they're the main agencies to deliver these things they have to be here and as you say perhaps we could leave over the rental supplement and the HAP and the rental to the, but I prefer to start with them all and then if we have to come back what do you think Deputy? Yeah well I, I just think Chairman the context of if the Secretary General is, is, is coming here that we structure the day that we have an, a, an agreement among ourselves as to how we're going to structure that day okay. because there's a body of work there as well uh, with how money is being spent within the department as well. Okay, so for today we put all those organisations on notice to be ready uh, on the 25th and by next week's meeting which is whatever date it is, the, the, the 11th, we will, we will have the Secretary give us a, a proposed structure of that meeting, how to handle it, maybe different time for different sections or an agenda for the meeting and a timetable for the meeting. But I want to put the, all those people on notice to be ready for now. And we'll come back to how we structure the meeting the next day. Can I ask as well, uh, Chairman, in the, in the context of that, and I've asked Pete Hughes in this, and it's like running around the field trying to get an answer in terms of state-owned lands, uh, council owned lands and a breakdown and that that document uh, be provided to us ahead of that meeting uh, because we hear a lot of talk uh, when we talk about capital construction uh, and, and, and where the possibility exists for the tens of thousands of homes that can be built. Can we ask the department that provide us on a, on a tabular basis, county by county, uh, the land that is in uh, both local authority ownership and state ownership as well, uh, and the status of that land in terms of zoning and so forth, whether they're part of the land aggregation schemes, all of that breakdown. Uh, so the, and we have that in good time ahead of that meeting, Chairman. Okay. If, that, if that request can be put in now, I, I would make that so that we can have it uh, well, in, well in advance of, of the meeting. Yeah. So that agency, I think now, the land aggregation agency, if I recollect correctly, they are the housing and sustainable communities. They, they have the land yeah. that came they from land they, they have schedules of every piece of land that took over from the local authorities and what they should. Yeah. Chairman, because trying to get these guys to provide something in, 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 in one form Well, if we don't get the answers on the day, they'll be back a second time. It's as simple as that. Um, Deputy Connor. Can I just, I want to support Deputy Castles in relation to this, and I, I take a particular interest in housing, and whatever about the voluntary association okay. coming in, I, the sustainable, the two, the department and the housing, the Department and the Housing and Sustainable Communities agents, mm. are, they're the ones that are subject to the controller and Auditor General. Mm. So they're the two we definitely want in here. And the HAP. And, and no, no, and HAP so. comes into it anyway. HAP yeah. is under the Department. And this year it'll be 300 million. Yeah. Last year, it doubled this year. So it's gone from 150 to 300, and presumably a double. But just, just a moment. I, I read that chapter. Yeah. Uh, the, the and it's clearly, currently, there is no statutory regulation of right. AHVs. Okay, they're on a voluntary basis. Secondly, there are so many schemes in relation to those 
uh, with various CILF, CAF, and yeah. various names that it's difficult. There are also various types of tenancies. Yeah. We always understood that voluntary body, just my understanding was you got a local authority house and you, you could go for a voluntary house. The only distinction in the past was you could buy out the local authority house, you could never buy out the other one. Now it seems there are many other distinctions, not, to, not least of which is the oversight in relation to it and the absence of security of tenure. So there are serious issues here with millions going in. In relation to the land, it would be simple, in my opinion, for the City Council and the County Council in Galway to be able to tell the Department, this is the land we have under our direct ownership, this is the zoning on it, and these are the plans we have for it. Just, just in plain, simple English. And then, what other public lands? Again, I use Galway. We have the Kent Station with 14 acres huge potential, yet it's been developed by a private person on behalf of CIE with no regard or no connection with an overall plan. We have the docks, which is waiting to be taken in charge. All of the other small ports have been taken in charge, I understand. And you might say, what relevance is this? It is huge land bank with huge potential for housing. So we have the existing land that's under direct control of the City Council, and then we have public land under, say, CIE or the docks. Or well, I didn't even, the idea. I didn't even go there. So we, we do need clarity beforehand, so we have information before we go in here on the day. Just a point that De De Deputy Connolly made, Chairperson, um, and, and she cited Galway. Uh, can we make a request of the Department that indeed all 31 local authorities submit what they have currently with the Department requesting funding uh, for capital projects and also uh, what's currently in the pipeline as well on the ground in terms of construction so we can get an appraisal of where they are and where they want to be because we hear consistently uh, in terms of all these, all these projects that they supply uh, all 31 local authorities requests for funding and also what's in, in progress at the moment. Right. I mean, that, that, that should be... Yeah, absolutely, we should be able to get that by tomorrow. A, a big element of that equation is the request from the approved housing bodies to the department for their developments. I find that separate again, but what, yeah. at the moment, if we have the Secretary General here, we want to get from the department in terms of where the local authorities are at as well. Yeah. And we can, if, if you, Chairman, want to portion the day to do it in, in two sections, but we're, yeah, we'll come back. We're, we're not. We're, that's why I want all this information ahead of the day and that we're not letting somebody out of the room uh, and not having dealt with it in a substantial manner. The, the only reason I'm mentioning the approved housing body, from my practice, nearly everything that's going on is through an approved housing body. They're far more going to the Department for Housing Development, just to my own observation, from approved housing bodies than there is from local authorities. So that's what I think they're the bigger, they're the elephant in the room. I, I they're the with, elephant in the yeah, room. I agree with you, Chair, but I don't think it's the, it's the role to be here. I think the, the role is to see what the department is doing in terms of oversight. Okay. With the vast volumes that are going in yeah. and the types of schemes that the, the department have set up, that's the most important thing. Otherwise, we're going to have a half a day going to talk to a voluntary body in terms of vision and mission, oh, rather no. than the, just rather than the oversight and the amount of money and just confirmation that the housing sustainable, whatever yeah. the name of it is, the housing and sustainable communities yeah. agency will have representatives of that body in here. Yeah, they're department officials. Well, they're, they're two separate. No, no, they're yeah. separate agents. Oh, the housing agent here. Yeah, yeah okay. Separate, they, separate they state there. body. They're so separate. if we have the department in and we have that in, our hands are going to be full okay. in relation to trying to tease out all of these issues. But then do you want, but we will want to deal with HAP. But it come, it HAP is inevitable. You have to deal with But it. rental supplement is so, it's just a change of one to the other. You, we you have know, no, this is one goes down, the other goes up. They're, 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 they're fundamentally the same thing. You go from one to the other, you transfer from one what? to the other. You transfer from, from HAP to, or from RAS to HAP eventually. Yeah. Everybody that was in RAS is not going to be in HAP. Yeah. There's a rental supplement which they're phasing out, except for emergencies. There's HAP, which is the permanent only game in town, and there's RAS, the rental accommodation scheme. Yeah. There are just three of the schemes in relation to supporting the private market. Yeah. Briefly, okay. Briefly, Chairman, I think it would be important, like there's so many voluntary housing associations, that, uh, uh, and they're all in receipt of, of state money, yeah. in my understanding. I'm, I'm open to correction on that. I think nobody knows where they are, what they're doing. I think it would be a mistake not to investigate those in detail. Well, yeah, I know we won't go through them one by one, but I think I saw somewhere yesterday there's 6,000 staff implied in the approval. And they all have 6,000 staff. Sure. 
That, that 6,000 staff, sir, there's not a fraction of that in the combined housing departments of all the local authorities. Oh. Hundreds reported on by the controller and auditor general. Some of them are kind of dormant, but... 547 yeah. bodies. Yeah. So, some of them are... So, I agree with you, but I, I don't think it's for that day. I think that day is for us to see what the department and that agency... What, what, we're looking at governance. We're looking at money. I think we should have a separate day where they come in. Yeah. Okay. Just so maybe I didn't need to, I have no intention of getting into the individual approved housing bodies regarding their plans and their concepts. All I was interested about the approved housing body is what funding the department has given to them to do the job. It's the department. Tell us that. Give, yeah. 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 That, that, that's, yeah. Look, at, for next week, we'll ask the secretary to have worked up a, a, a programme because the big issue in relation to housing is, and nobody has mentioned it here yet because we mention it every day in this house, is the issue of homelessness. Do we keep that funding for homelessness because there's 109 million support for homelessness in 2017? I think. We can't do everything on the one day. We want to deal with the construction and all that sort of stuff. So I'll just list that as an issue, so in case somebody says, why didn't you talk about the homelessness? I'll ask the Secretariat to give to, to draft a structured way of dealing with the housing issue. And it's not all going to happen on, on that day. So we'll have to decide which topics we're dealing with. And I think it's house starts and house building is where we're starting with, you know. So, okay, so <clears throat> that's on that particular issue. Next issue then, um, <clears throat> the CNAG, just in terms of our work programme, the CNAG issued his report last Friday. Um, as everybody knows, um, he ha has chapters on approximately half the government departments and the people like the revenue commissioners. And I would suggest that fairly soon, and people can, these are only suggestions, um, as part of our work programme, and we have ongoing things in our work programme, but I think the issue of the revenue commissioners needs to be examined fairly soon in terms of um, the progress in tax. There is a chapter on tobacco smuggling, um, high wealth individuals' tax liabilities, corporation tax losses, which we dealt with, and PRSI contribution for the self employed. There is quite a bit there for the revenue commissioners, and I think we can start with them fairly early on um, in our work programme. Yeah, the PRSI is more a matter for the Department of uh, Employment Affairs and Social Protection. Yeah, okay. And then there is there, there's something else for deeper in relation to um, um, collection of pension contributions to the exchequer. Is that deeper? Deeper. So that needs to be dealt with deeper, wondering. You have that on the list. The high wealth individuals' tax liabilities. Yeah, that, that's the one I mentioned, the revenue commissioners. Like, I think people would benefit from a public discussion. The public discussion would benefit from a full, open, transparent discussion on that. On, the, on that topic. So look, at, I think we'll try and list revenue as promptly as possible to come in. Um, then I, I'm just mentioning, and if anyone has any other comments, Patient activity in acute public hospitals. Yeah. There's, there's yeah. no monitoring of that. There's no, yeah. no mechanisms in place to give clear information. Yeah. Um, that, that, that's, so that's two issues listed so far. Um, we have to deal with everything in the CNAG's report as the year goes by, but I'm just trying to identify a few for early, early on. Um, because the CNAG has a chapter on the oversight of approved housing bodies, but that will, that's for the department. Um, then the next issue we want to deal with somewhere along the line is this hepatitis C treatment fund that has now cost 1.5 billion. I know it's a historic issue, but you know we're on the verge of starting another one of these issues with the cervical check, and somebody's going to be here in five or ten years' time, and we want to know. Really, I want to interrogate the department at the end of that process, what lessons were learned to prevent some of these major scale issues arising again. And I, we haven't seen evidence that they worked anyway. So I would like to put that issue, because it's such a big issue. Um, the State Claims Agency are already on a work programme in terms of the handling of the, um, the cervical check issues. And what I would say to the people, if for the next meeting anybody has any particular item they want on out of the CNAG's report to move early. But we've mentioned three or four there. So I will ask the Secretary to try and work on those three or four. Based on decisions that we've made, what the, the clerk uh, has to do in relation to meetings, because we've three or four meetings we've got to tie down yeah. in the next couple yeah. of weeks. Dr. Yeah. Love, the OPW, yeah. uh, the whistleblower in relation yeah. to uh, defence or in relation to prisons. Service. Um, 
we kind of once we know more next week, we might be able to slot in what we're going to do yeah. with regards to it. Yeah. So I would ask for next week. This only takes us for the next <clears throat> couple of weeks. It may be a possible work schedule to take us to well beyond November, or early December. A draft. Yeah. The next. Yeah. Next Maybe to a draft. A draft of Christmas. <laughs> So, are, are we going to be here next summer, the last of us? <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> I think at this day, we, we, we've had a useful discussion, a little bit behind schedule, but I'm going to... Sorry. Clarification on one thing. Yeah. You know the thalidomide and the yes. question that came in, did we deal with that and write back out to them? Yeah, we're dealing with that with the state claims agency. No, no, it was an individual that wrote into us. I was it through David, uh -huh. David Cullen and I uh, yeah, I the Irish that. Thalidomide Association yeah. had a letter dated the 30th of July. I thought we held that over. No, no, you might just come. We'll come back to it next week. Yeah, what did we do? Come to the state claims agency. We're going to bring it to the state claims agency. Oh, yeah, that's on okay. That. Yeah, yeah, I knew it was the state claims agency yeah, came that's in. Correct. Because the, stat no, the statute of limitations issue. It was in relation to a number of questions that, yes. that they raised in relation to the we've, day that we were We've written it as they Yeah, lovely. That's fine. So thank it you. will come back to us. Yeah, so at this stage, I'm going to suspend for five minutes while the witnesses take their seats. Okay? And today we will be dealing with Chagas financial statements for 2016-2017 and we're joined from Chagas by Professor Jerry Boyle, Director and Tom Doherty, Chief Operations Officer. The representative from the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine is Kevin Smith. Uh, can I remind members and witnesses and all those in the public gallery uh, to turn off all mobile phones? That means putting them on airplane mode. The silence is not enough because it can interfere with the recording system. I wish to advise the witnesses that by virtue of 1721 of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to the committee. If you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to qualify privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to defect that that where possible you should not criticise or make charges against any person or persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or, or it identifiable. Members are reminded of the provisions of Standing Order 186 that the Committee shall refrain from inquiring into the merits of a policy or policies of the Government or a Minister of the Government or the merits or of the objectives of such policies. While we expect witnesses to answer questions put to them uh, by the committee, and uh, clearly with candour, witnesses can and should expect to be treated fairly and with respect and consideration of all, at all times in accordance with the witness protocol. So we'll start by taking the opening statement from the CNAG. Thank you, Chairman. The Agriculture and Food Development Authority of Ireland, better known as Chagask, was established in 1988. Its primary function is to provide education, training, advisory and research ser services to the agriculture and food industries and to rural communities. The Chagask financial statements before the committee this morning relate to 2017 and are consolidated statements incorporating the results of the Chagask subsidiary Moor Park Technology Limited, in which Chagask has a majority shareholding. The financial statements record total income of 183 million euros. Over three quarters of Chagas' income is accounted for by direct Oireachtas grants. The bulk of the remainder comprises advisory service and course fee income, research grants and commissions, and trading income from Chagas' own farming operations, including the sale of livestock. The authority's expenditure in 2017 totaled 178 million euros and is detailed in notes 7 and 8 to the financial statements. As the following figure uh, on screen indicates, pay, pensions and other staff costs accounted for two-thirds of the expenditure. Other expenditure related to Chagask's operations, including depreciation, amounted to 50 million euros or 28 per cent of the total. Grants of various kinds accounted for 10.2 million euros, or 6 per cent. The operating surplus for the year was just over 5 million euros. 
I issued a clear audit opinion in respect of the financial statements for 2017. However, I drew attention to the disclosure in the Statement on Internal Control regarding expenditure in 2017 of €1.35 million, Euros, where the procurement procedures employed did not comply with public procurement guidelines. Members may also wish to note the presentation with the financial statements of a governance statement and authority members' report. Presentation of a report of this kind is a requirement from 2017 for all state bodies operating under the 2016 Code of Practice for the Governance of State Bodies issued by the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. As well as describing the governance structures in place in Tiagosk, the governance statement includes additional information about expenditure on consultancy and legal services, travel and subsistence costs incurred, and spending on staff and corporate hospitality. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. And now I call Mr. Wilde to make the opening statement. Thanks, Cahir. Look, uh, I welcome this opportunity to present um, a brief opening statement to the committee. The Chagas mandate. Uh, is set out in the 1988 uh, Agriculture Research Training and Advice Act and it comprises three components to provide or procure educational training and advisory services in agriculture, to obtain and make available to the agricultural industry the scientific and practical information in relation to agriculture required by it, and to understand, promote, encourage, assist, coordinate, facilitate and review agricultural research and development including research and development in relation to food processing and the food processing industry. Uh, in regards to governance, the Chagas Authority is accountable to the Minister for Agriculture, Food and the Marine and is responsible for ensuring good governance through setting strategic objectives and targets and by taking strategic decisions on all key business issues. The day-to-day -day management, control and direction of Chagas are the responsibility of the director and the senior management team. Chagas fully adheres to the Code of Practice for the Governance of State-Sponsored Bodies 2016 and adheres to all circulars emanating from the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine and the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. Chagas' system of internal control is supported by its Audit and, Re and Risk Committee, comprising three authority members, one of whom is Chair, another is the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine's representative on the authority, and there is also an external member with significant financial and audit expertise. The Audit and Risk Committee is supported by an internal audit function which reports to it. The Authority's Operations Committee provides oversight on the effectiveness and efficiency of all Chagas's administrative functions. Chagas maintains regular contact with the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine on administrative and programme matters. At the end of each year, a business plan for the year ahead is approved by the authority and an oversight agreement based on this plan is agreed with the department. The OA is regularly reviewed by the department in consultation <coughs> with Chagas. Each year, as required under the 1998 Act, Chagas also submits a proposed annual programme of activities for review to the department. Chagas also operates a rigorous performance and evaluation system involving external peer reviews of all of its programmes as well as the monitoring and tracking of key performance indicators. The mission of Chagas as adopted by the Authority is to support science-based innovation in the agri-food sector and the wider bioeconomy so as to underpin profitability, competitiveness and sustainability. The Authority has adopted four goals to improve the competitiveness of agriculture, food and the wider bioeconomy, to support sustainable farming and the environment, to encourage diversification of the rural economy and enhance the quality of life in rural areas, and to enhance organisational capability and deliver value for money. Chagas has six operational programmes. Animal grassland research and innovation, food research, crops environment and land use, rural economy and development, advisory and extension, and education and training. In addition, Chagas has a central administration service embracing finance, HR, ICT and corporate service functions. Chagas is a national organisation with sites distributed throughout the country in every county. 
It has 51 advisory offices, down from 90 following a, re a rationalization program in recent year years, four colleges of further education and seven research centres. In regards to Chagas finances, Chagas is obliged each year to match its expenditure with its income. It is unique as a non-commercial body in having a relatively large proportion of non-grant and aid income, some 57, 56 million in 2017. This non-GIA income comprises grants awarded to Chagas as a result of success in competitions for research and advisory funds at national and EU level, advisory and education fees, farm operations, industry levies and the sale of various professional services. In 2017, Chagas received 125 million grant in aid, including an amount for pensions of 43 million, to meet its current expenditure needs, and a further capital grant of 3.15 million. In regards to capital requirements, uh, in the absence of access to borrowing facilities, Chagas faces significant challenges in funding its working capital requirements. This issue has become more acute in recent years as Chagas' non-grant and aid, aid income has increased significantly. Similarly, in the absence of a borrowing facility, longer-term capital funding for a research and educational infrastructure is even more challenging. Chagas' grant and aid earmarks a relatively small amount of funding for infrastructural purposes, which is only sufficient to partially cover maintenance costs and undertake some minor capital works. More substantial infrastructural needs are funded as the opportunity arises through the sale of assets that are no longer programme priorities, or through once-off special grants from government. Reliance on asset sales as a funding mechanism is not a sustainable basis on which to fund ongoing infrastructural needs, and while the availability of special capital grants is welcome, the process results in an episodic funding schedule. While Chagas received an unqualified audit certificate in 2017, the Comptroller and Auditor General did draw attention to some procurement issues. Chagas is making every effort to be as fully compliant as possible in regards to its procurement practices. Significant improvement in procurement procedures have been implemented in recent years to the recruitment of specialist staff and the development of robust systems. Procurement, it should be noted in Chagas, is complex due to our diversified activities and the geographical dispersal of our sites. The issues reported in the financial statements were discovered and brought to the attention of the Comptroller and Auditor General by Chagas. In the main, the reported matters were due to two factors. Number one, quotes being sought from a number of local suppliers rather than advertising through e-tenders. We are satisfied that this did not adversely impact value for money, given the number of quotes sought and the type of services procured. Secondly, extension of existing contracts for services where the requirement was being reviewed, where there were delays in the implementation of the Office of Government Procurement process, or where a similar service had already been procured from that supplier. While no breaches, Chairman, can be tolerated, it is noted that the breaches amounted to tender values of 1.35 million out of a total expenditure of 42 million, or 3.2 per cent. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much for that opening statement. Um, first speaker is Deputy Pat Deering, who is 20 minutes, followed by Deputy Bobby Ayer, the 15 minutes, and then all other speakers of 10 minutes. Uh, thanks, Chairman. Uh, uh, welcome, uh, uh, Professor Boyle, and, and your, uh, your colleagues here this morning. I have a number of questions. I might make up to 20 minutes because I have another meeting to go to, uh, Chairman. With regard to the operating surplus for last year, uh, we had an operating surplus which has reduced almost 3 million uh, from year on year. Uh, could you give us an indication of why that is the case, uh, considering at the same time the uh, advisory fees have gone up considerably in the same period of time? Thank you, Deputy. Um, the first point I should uh, explain about the operating surplus is that um, Chagas uh, doesn't aim ever to have any surplus. We, we are obliged to match expenditure with income. And uh, I, I, the second point I'd like to make is that um, 
I think tension should be focused on the surplus for the financial year lower down. It's, it's lower down the, the actual column, just under note 11, where uh, the surplus did uh, decline from 6.152 to 2.398. Um, the, the, the reason is, is, is quite simple. Um, as I say, in, in we normally, or we don't expect to have a surplus, but um, in recent years we've been having significant difficulty in trying to manage cash flow. So we sought leave to put in place an overdraft facility, um, and uh, that wasn't uh, forthcoming from uh, our parent department, our permission wasn't for coming, or indeed uh, ultimately from deeper. So the decision was taken then to try and build up a capital reserve uh, in order to uh, be able to meet on a sustainable basis our current capital, our recurrent capital requirements. And uh, in 2016, we were able through prudent management to generate such a surplus. But I want to emphasize that would not be the norm. The norm this would be a, a, a rainy day fund as such. Yeah, precisely. But we felt that was a prudent thing to do because we were quite concerned about uh, our ability to manage cash flow in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a prudent way. And the department did support us in this respect. Um, in 2017, then, because this is, a, if you like, an opportunistic type of activity, the same opportunity didn't generate itself because of. Uh, demands on, on, on current expenditure. The, the 2 million, if you look, 2.398 million there, the financial surplus, broken down roughly between a million uh, from the capital side of our activities in the sense that we didn't uh, spend as we had thought we would have spent in relation to capital, and the other is from the, uh, the current budget side. So I suppose in summary I'd say it's unusual to have any surplus. Uh, but the reason why we have a surplus and whenever we have the opportunity for the next couple of years, we want to build that up to probably uh, a significantly higher sum given uh, the nature of our, of our activities. So we and took can I, the sorry, sorry, I cut across you, Professor. Uh, what, uh, what, in the event that you do build that up, that fund up, uh, what do you intend doing with it to mind it as such? Well, um, obviously, this fund will be, will be ring-fenced uh, and only used as we need it. We'd, I'd far prefer, to be honest with you, to be able to use a fund like this for long-term capital investment, because we have serious deficits in the organisation infrastructure terms. Uh, but at the same time, we're being prudent here in saying, look, we want to ring-fence a fund here to ensure that we can meet our recurrent capital requirements. For example, we, a lot of the time we get income um, uh, we sort of, we incur activities before we get paid for those activities, if you like, and also sometimes it can take a long period of time to recover monies on projects where we have actually um, uh, spent resources on. So we have a very clear cash flow issue, and so that's the basis of. Okay. With regard to the advisory fees, then, how do you determine those fees, considering that they've increased uh, from from one year to the next? How are they determined? Well, the, the process of, of determining the advisory fees is, of course, uh, when we are proposing any change in fees, um, the authority, well, the, the, the Advisory and Education Committee of the Authority reviews the arguments for uh, fee increases. They tend to be quite marginal from year to year. And, we, and then the uh, authority subcommittee or committee makes a recommendation to the full authority uh, and if they are adopted by the full authority, then they have to be approved by the Minister for Agriculture, Food and the Marine. So that's the process. So from year to year, the actual fee increases are, are, are quite marginal. You're, you're aware, Deputy, I'm sure, that we're going to recover the full cost of our activities because much of our advisory activity will be classified as public good activity. Uh, but we do recover a significant cost. Um, also, in recent years, what's happened, and this is underlying the, um, the growth in external income to a significant extent, um, the government has um, put out tenders for the delivery of a number of uh, schemes, of large schemes, such as GLOSS, the administration of GLOSS, for example, would be one of the biggest ones. We competed to provide that service, and therefore that generates a large 
amount of income on top of the charges that we make to farmers. Okay. With regard to the advisory fees again, is there any bad debts? And if there is, what percentage would it be, approximately? Um, there are bad debts. They tend to be small in nature. I don't have the percentage um, figure with me here, but we can supply that. Um, they tend to be relatively small. In, uh, and we do have, uh, I mean, again, our authority and the audit committee, uh, we make a determined effort to recover uh, all bad debts. And only in, where we have reached the end of the road do we, uh, do we write off those those debts. We, we, we wrote out about, um, uh, we wrote off 113,000 in bad debt in 2017. 113,000? Yeah. That's across 12 advisory regions. We have 45,000 clients, right? So we think that's, okay, no, no write-off is acceptable, but I think in the context of the overall uh, income that we generate from advisory fees of close to 12 million, um, it, it's not uh, an entirely uh, bad figure. Okay. Uh, moving on, uh, with this regard to disposal of, of assets, uh, can you tell us at the moment how much land does Tagus own? Yeah, Chagas own approximately, and, and this is just uh, not utilised agricultural area, approximately 1,800 hectares across all of our sites, mainly our uh, six of our research sites and our four agricultural colleges. That would be our, our total land holding. When, when was that recently valued? Um, we don't, we have a, a space historic evaluation basis. We haven't, uh, I don't know, when was that done? Um, we don't, uh, is it? If I can answer, uh, yeah. Deputy, yeah, we um, we don't have a policy of regular revaluation of our land. Um, we have given careful consideration to this because the um, the assets are stated in the financial statements at historical cost value. However, uh, if we were to adopt a policy of revaluation, then we would have to revalue the lands on a regular basis. It would be a relatively um, expensive. Um, Okay. Well, with regard to other, sorry, with regard to other property, uh, other than lands, you have other properties as well that you've been disposing yeah. of from time to time, uh, and I presume there would be um, a database of properties that you may be looking at again to dispose of. Uh, and would they have been revalued in yeah, recent well, times? And, and in the event that they have, how do you come to the, the conclusion that you're going to dispose of A, B, C, D, or E? But Chairman, on, in relation to, of course, any land that uh, we would dispose of, and uh, typically our property disposals would involve land. Um, we, of course, uh, we, we approach that in a professional manner. We engage professional advice to ensure that the valuation is, uh, is, is based on market value and that we get the best value for the state in that respect. So there, there is a whole process that kicks into place involving um, the various committees of the authority. Ultimately, Again, the authority has to decide on whether uh, to proceed with a disposal or not. And uh, the key issue there is uh, to ensure that uh, market value and appropriate value is being obtained for the disposal. That again then is, has to be proposed, uh, or sorry, has to be sanctioned by the Minister for Agriculture, Food and the Marine. So in relation to disposals, there's a very clear uh, approach and process in place. Uh, now, obviously, the decision to dispose of any property is not taken lightly. Um, apart from ensuring that we get the maximum value possible based on market assessment of value, uh, of course, the key issue for us to ensure that the land is no longer a programme priority for Chagas. And, um, and have you identified, going forward, potential... Uh, properties or land that you may be yeah. going to sell. Considering, like in the last in 2017, uh, you made a loss of 192,000 compared to the previous year of over a million uh, in disposal of assets. Uh, and you do also mention that it is not sustainable to rely on assets disposal uh, to fund infrastructure going forward as well. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, have you identified at this stage whether you may dispose of assets in the future, or, or if so, have you identified where those assets may be? Yes, we have, uh, Deputy. In, um, in the rationalisation programme that, Ton that Chagas undertook um, from the, in the period up to 2012-2013, uh, we identified uh, a number of properties 
uh, that uh, should be sold. These were mainly advisory offices. And uh, as I said in my opening statement, uh, 2012, or sorry, in 2010, we had about 91 offices and we sold off about 40 of those. In that rationalisation plan, we also identified that uh, the closure of our Kinsili site, uh, which had been um, uh, used for research purposes, uh, for mainly horticultural research purposes in the past, um, but we identified that we could accommodate all of our research requirements at that time at our Ashtown site. So we migrated all the staff from the main offices there at uh, Kinsili to Ashton. And um, we are in the process of, we've, of uh, selling that site. We haven't commenced the actual process yet because uh, we, we have secured professional advice on to how we can maximise the value of this, uh, to the state from that transaction. And have you valuation on that at all? Yes, we have, a, we have an initial valuation without planning permission of €12 million. Euro. Now, obviously, uh, we would like to retain all of the proceeds of that sale uh, for investment in our infrastructural requirements, which are many. Uh, but that is a matter to be determined by our parent department and the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. We certainly hope they will accept the logic of our position that given that we uh, have, uh, other than uh, once-off grants, we have really no other recourse other than to use the proceeds of sale. And this would be a very welcome sale. Uh, but in the nature of things, this is a couple of years down the road. And your priority for that, in the event that the 12 million was realised, the priority for that 12 million. Well, we have short, we have short medium term. We, we have in the in the immediate term, we have a serious requirement to build a whole new suite of labs at Johnstown Castle to address the uh, environmental research programme within Chagas around uh, climate change, water quality, and so on. That's our immediate requirement. But there are a number of other projects as well uh, that, um, that we would wish to pursue, including one example, one major cost for us that we have to fund out of our own resources and uh, public funds is the refurbishment and development of our agricultural colleges. We don't receive any grants from the Department of Education. It all comes through the agricultural vote, and that's a, a significant cost from time to time. Okay, you mentioned climate change, uh, Professor O'Boyle, and it's coming at us 100 miles an hour, as we all know now at this stage. Do you think, at the, you said you intend or would like to be able to invest a lot of that money in labs and so on and so forth going forward. Would you say we're playing catch-up now in this area at the moment? Well, personally, in agriculture, I feel we're absolutely not. Um, uh, I, I'm an ex officio member of the Climate Change Council. And uh, I'm quite aware of the measures being taken by other sectors. I personally think agriculture has been to the fore. And first of all, acknowledging the challenge that exists uh, uh, to the sector. And secondly, and most importantly, in identifying solutions. And my colleagues in Chagas, along with colleagues in universities and so on, um, we have identified a number of measures uh, in both agriculture, in in relation to mitigation options and in relation to sequestration and also in regards to replacement of fossil fuels with renewables, with biomass-based renewables. We've identified something like nearly 30 individual measures that, if adopted, could significantly address uh, the likely targets under the EU effort-sharing agreement by 2030. But, but would, you, would you say, though, you know, there's some people, and I wouldn't agree with them personally, though, who believe that climate change is a fallacy, uh, would you think that there's a PR job to be done with TAGAS and maybe the Department of Agriculture and all farming organisations in order to highlight what has been done, and I personally believe a lot has been done uh, in the whole sector, uh, in order to move that on? Because, uh, as I said, this issue is coming at us. 100 miles an hour. We have targets to meet to be probably not going to meet in the short term, but in the long term, possibly yes. So, would you think there's, there's a PR campaign to be to be waged on behalf of targets, may say, for example, maybe to to enlighten and inform what has been done and what can be done going forward? Well, I think in these in this situation, you can't have enough communication. I, I mean, we're involved on several fronts in relation to uh, environmental enhancement and environmental improvement. 
And the reality is, if you take something like a concern over water quality, there's a huge appreciation within the agricultural sector that that has to be dealt with. I would say you're right, Deputy, in suggesting that the same appreciation doesn't extend um, at this point in time to climate change, because uh, the visibility isn't there. We've been working very closely with Board B in trying to generate visibility among the farming community uh, as to the consequences and potential solutions to climate change mitigation. So, for example, we've introduced the concept of the carbon navigator, which is widely regarded across Europe as being a very innovative device, which indicates to farmers how normal practices, if you like, that can improve efficiency, can also improve um, in the environmental footprint. And, in other words, there's win-win. That's a positive. We're going to take that, our plan now for the next year is to sort of build on that and build on the publication that we produced that I mentioned in regard to mitigation options to build a whole campaign around driving sustainability on farms. And I think we're also discussing, of course, with our parent department where that can be extended in terms of policy because there has to be a suite of incentives for farmers to adopt some of the measures that we've identified. For example, there, there's two clear quick wins. We've suggested that um, a significant mitigation option on farming is to replace calcium ammonium nitrate with stabilised urea, which can not alone address uh, nitrous oxide emissions, but also, and a very important area that we've been drawing attention to, is the problem with ammonia. We think that's a wider problem beyond agriculture and probably isn't as fully appreciated. So, uh, and the other option, of course, is, and again, it's a technical point, the agricultural uh, colleagues will be familiar with this, uh, the spreading of slurry is a critical mechanism uh, to, diminish, to, to reduce emissions. So we, we are looking at various technologies, such as injection systems and trailing shoes and so on. Now, they, farmers will have to be informed, and there probably will have to be incentives put in place to ensure that those kind of technologies are adopted. And going forward, as you're aware, obviously, we have, we have ambitious targets from the whole agricultural sector in Foodwise 2025. How, how do you think we can balance that particular equation of the targets to be achieved under Foodwise 2025 and the ambition that is there with the challenges that, that climate change presents at the moment? Well, Deputy, this is a real challenge. I've said in public, I've gone on the record, are saying there is an incompatibility at the moment between the trajectory for cow numbers um, and uh, our greenhouse gas obligations by 2030. There definitely is. We've identified, as I said, uh, Chagas with the department and other um, bodies that are researching this area, mitigation and uh, sequestration options. But they will not be sufficient to offset the trajectory in terms of cow numbers. That's the reality. And that is something that has to be faced up to. And I think... Um, Certainly the point you made about awareness and the importance of identifying uh, the problem in the first instance that we're facing and then of course coming up with solutions. Um, and I think that that is definitely a dilemma for the, for the industry. Okay. Uh, one final area I want to ask you about, uh, Professor, and you don't mention it, maybe if you don't mind, but uh, it's a Greenfield site in Kilkenny. Yes. Uh, has come in for some criticism in more recent times, rightly or wrongly, uh, for the type of model that has been created there. Uh, can you tell us, as well, for the benefit of the committee, first of all, the, the investment that Tigers have put into it, the different stakeholders that are involved initially? Okay, in terms of the Greenfield site, um, this is a partnership between Chagas and a number of uh, private entities comprising Glanbia, uh, the Irish Farmers Journal Trust and a private uh, farm family. Um, and uh, we have made no investment in the facility. Our involvement is uh, we provide managerial advice. We provide advice on the model to be implemented on the farm. And we also supply the services of, um, of an officer, a Moor Park um, staff member, who works with the uh, manager on the site and liaises with the manager on the site and with the stakeholders in terms of the, the overall management of the farm. And is many, you have this land lease, is that correct? The, or what way, how has Sorry, the, 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 the company, it's a private company, okay. uh, uh, have leased the land from the owners, yes. But Chagas has no involvement in that. Our only involvement, as I say, is, in the, is in, in primarily 
uh, one of our staff members supports the manager on site, and then we provide the kind of high-level uh, information through our, our research services to the site. So basically, you're using it as, a, as a, a template for how maybe a system could be developed for the future. Is that correct? Yeah, it's, it was very much designed to enable new entrants into the farm, into agriculture, and particularly into dairy, to establish a farm that could be sustainable in, in economic terms at relatively low cost. And uh, it's been immensely successful in that respect because uh, we've established a number of discussion groups, and this is one of the roles of the Moor Park uh, officers, so-called, on the farm. They have, gener have established discussion groups of young people who have come into dairying for the first time and uh, who are enabled through the model to, um, to put together the investment needed. And uh, we're obviously very conscious uh, of the, uh, the importance of communicating full information on the operation of the farm, the successes and the failures, if you like. And most recently, of course, in, during Storm Emma, there was, uh, there was concerns there around a number, uh, a number of um, animal deaths. Two cows and six calves died during that process, during that uh, storm. And uh, we have commissioned a review, chaired by the former uh, Secretary General of the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, um, along with the other partners in the project. And uh, we're awaiting finalisation of that review as we speak. But certainly we think there will be lessons learned in terms of the model and in terms of managing uh, 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 an extreme event like that into the future. Uh, and is this is your... In the, is it a 15-year project? Is it my right? It's a 15-year project. Are we in year what at the I moment? I think we're about the mid, mid, midway, about year seven, I think. Yeah. And just as my, uh, for, the, for my own benefit and for the benefit of the community, I suppose, how do profit margins look year on year? Uh, up to this year, uh, we've been the, the farm has been bu building up significant reserves. It's it's and it's been very useful as a demonstration facility for other farms because it's a full cost model. Um, for example, all of the labour is fully costed on all of the land, so it's a complete fully costed model. And there is really no other uh, entity out there uh, that has that, uh, has, have, have those financial data. It's simply not available in a normal farming situation to be able to full comp. But this year, like a lot of farms, and it's a particularly, it was affected by the drought to a significant degree, so uh, there were substantial extra costs incurred this year in particular. Yeah, thanks, Professor. Thank you, uh, Deputy. And you, Deputy Aylward next. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, I welcome Professor Weil and Charles here. And good to see you here again uh, for your annual address. Uh, um, I know you're doing a good job as far as farms are concerned, being one myself who avails of your service and very appreciative. Of I just want to follow up on, on the last question by my colleague here in Kilkenny, because I'm from Kilkenny naturally. The death of the animals. Is it because of the intensity in the farm and the way the system is working? And um, can you evolve and why they died and what reason what these animals were, were caused it over the storm? Is it because they had protection, we say, in building, or uh, was the land too exposed? Because I know the system in place and it's very, uh, very intensive. And uh, I know it's probably a lot of experimenting going on there as well. Well, uh, Deputy, there wouldn't be much experimenting really going on. It's, it's a fairly straightforward enough um, model. It's a dairy system, isn't it? Oh, it is, yeah. It's, it's, it's designed to be a top-class dairy farm That's right. uh, based on, on uh, minimising investment and minimising production costs. Um, the, we, we have commissioned a review along with um, the other partners, and that review is not yet complete. So I, I think it would be inappropriate for me to get into what is a, a, a draft review at this point. But the, the episodes that occurred, occurred due primarily, as far as we can see, to the storm event itself. Uh, it was an extraordinary event um, uh, in terms of the build-up of, of snow and drifts over a very short period of time. Um, and even though we, the, the farm had taken preventive measures, they clearly weren't sufficient. Now, in the wider context of the overall animal health stats on the farm and the mortality statistics, uh, the episodes, while utterly regrettable, 
are not significant. I mean, the overall health status of the animals and the mortality. The animals are kept outdoor mostly, aren't they? They, they are, yeah. They're, I mean, not, they're not like what we call traditional, where they're brought in. No, the but obviously there, there's housing for uh, pregnant uh, animals and so on, and for young calves. But that's something that, uh, again, that's at the heart of the review. Um, and we, we would hope that it will be lessons coming forward. One of the reviewers, for example, we brought in uh, was from Canada, who was familiar with dairy farming under extreme weather conditions. Uh, so uh, we would hope to benefit from the insights presented um, uh, from that review. I should say I have uh, a long-standing commitment to the Agriculture Committee to present uh, the results of that, um, of, uh, of that review when the whole thing is finalised. Okay. I just want to move on. I'm going to touch on things that uh, Deputy Deering as well, because uh, just on the 1,800 hectares that you have, 1,800, I think you said, they have hectares, is most of that for uh, land that land owned, that's land based, that you use for, for um, research purposes and uh, like, like a and etc. Yeah, I mean, the. the as I say, that, now that's not, and in fact I don't have that data, uh, I don't have the utilised agricultural area because there is a lot of forest on many of those lands um, around the country. But yes, uh, the, uh, we, we have six research sites, uh, the likes of Moor Park, for example, if I take Moor Park as an example, um, we have 175 he hectares farmed that we own at Moor Park. We also have a... Um, uh, quite an amount of land lease. I'm not counting lease land, obviously, in that total. The, the 1,800 hectares is owned land. It's in lease land, I thought. Do you, uh, do you lease land to farmers? Oh, you do, yeah. To farmers, yeah. Or? yeah. No, no, we lease land from farmers. Oh, sorry, you le oh, sorry lease land in. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, yes, yeah, sorry, the other way. <laughs> Um, we, we lease land from, from farmers, like for example the famous Curtin farm, yeah. uh, Curtin's farm in Moor Park is leased. We, on the agricultural colleges, um, the land on the agricultural colleges, if I, uh, say for example in Kildalton, we own 158 hectares there in Kildalton. That's um, primarily used for educational purposes, for the training of students. Yeah. But We've taken the decision in recent years to also locate significant research projects um, on all of our college farms. So in Clonakilty College, for example, we have a major project on the way there on the use of, uh, of clover um, in ryegrass uh, and ryegrass swards, which has been generating really interesting results that have been uh, of international significance. We also actually have located uh, on the Kildalton site what we call a sustainable farm and our, our intention there is it's, it's in early days yet is to establish a farm that meets all of this demanding sustainability requirements right across the, uh, the spectrum but yet is commercial. So that's a, that's a research um, project and of course at Ballyhays for several years, uh, Ballyhays College, we've had a research program on, on the way there. On, on dairying in, in the region, uh, which again has, has established that it's possible to generate uh, significant profits in a more challenging landscape, shall we say, than Park. And so, so that, that, that's been the plan, that we would have a research programme also underway in the colleges. Can I ask you, have you identified land, due, due to the directive from the government recently about semi-state land, particularly with the housing crisis that we have, uh, have you have land or property that would be suitable for sale for housing? I know it's mostly rural with yourselves, but uh, are there land that you own that could be uh, used for say affordable or social housing and have you identified some sites so that you mentioned the control on other gentlemen mentioned three sites here that uh, disclose that in, in page 106 disclose that this includes land for resale one site in Emory Gallery and Cabin two sites in County Dublin a total in calorie value of 914,000 I just want to ask yeah. you those uh, that the control on other gentlemen identify well, the, first of all the, the valuations there are historic valuations um, but th th there would be two th there are two sites in Dublin that um, potentially the state could, could, uh, could if it wished, uh, consider. Would that be a priority for Chagos to identify? Oh, well, uh, if I can just uh, sort of elaborate on that. The, the, the site in, um, in Kinsili, which I mentioned earlier in reply to uh, Deputy, um, Deputy Deering, um, that site, we intend to put that on the market. Now, it doesn't have planning permission at the moment for residential use. 
Yeah, it's not zoned for, sorry, for residential use at the minute. But um, that's a possibility. So I think there's about 12 hectares in that, is it? Yeah, about 25 acres. Yeah, about 12 hectares or so. So that is actually going to go on the market and potentially could be used for... That would be one site could be used for social for. housing. The other site uh, is in Dublin also, is the Ashtown site, which is there in Castle Lock. There's about 12 um, hectares there at the minute. That is chock-a-block with activity right at the minute, because as I did say, we moved all of our activity down from Kinsealy, down the motorway to Ashtown, and it's a hive of activity. It's absolutely top program priority. We, we have three different types of activity going on there at the minute. It's the location for our meat centre. All our meat research that Chagas does is located in Ashton. Um, and we work very closely with the production research in Grange on beef. We also have, uh, it's the centre also for our, for our horticultural activity and we've only recently invested in a number of state-of-the-art glass houses. We also use it for um, uh, our education programmes as an adjunct to our facility in Botanic Gardens for horticultural education. It's also the location of uh, Meat Technology Ireland. And in the last year, again, with pressures from Brexit and everything else, and with support from the department and the minister, we've invested substantially in, a, in facilities and equipment for the prepared consumer food sector. So, uh, Deputy, this is very much program priority, and every inch of space is absolutely dedicated at the moment to top priority research program. Can I move on? Because I want to ask you a few things. The father shortage, I just want to ask you your opinion on the father shortage. Twelve were talking about there in, in, in August, September, about 30% of a, a father shortage. Uh, and now the Minister even said last week that oh, that is now down to 10%. I want to, what's your opinion of it? As Chagas has advised everybody, what's your opinion on where farmers are at in father shortage? And will we have an on, continuing an ongoing problem in the winter ahead, like we had last year, we say, due to the bad weather and then the coastal drought that came after that? Okay, well, I don't uh, have just to, a general opinion. Yeah, look, the, the opinion is we have done two further surveys, and Chagas has coordinated that. We're, 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 we're uh, members uh, and uh, we coordinate the interagency fodder committee that was established by the Minister to deal with this and to respond to this um, situation, the fodder situation. Um, we, we've, we did a survey in around June, and it was showing, I think that's where your 30% figure might have come from a deficit in relation to fodder, uh, the fodder that was available. We refreshed and did a new survey in, uh, more recently, and there was a significant improvement between the first and the second. The first one, as I say, the average is about 30, of course there's a range about that. The second survey we did came in with an average deficit of about 12%. Of course there is a range about that. What did that survey done? Um, I'm trying to think about that now. It was done probably two weeks before the ploughing. Right, because I met a good few silage trailers through Leash last weekend. So well, they're still out there. They're, <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, it, it cut up, so you could. It's improved. Well, I'd say, if anything, it's improved, it's improved since improved then. A bit since no, 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 it has. No, no, it, and look, it's important that we get, look, this is our best available F, um, information here. It's, it's, you know, it's given completely independently, and we believe that that's the situation, and it has improved, and in fact, you know, a lot of farmers probably plan to graze on a lot longer this year if the weather still holds up. Having said all of that, of course, we're very conscious that there are people, there's an enormous range. I mean, one thing that I found this year traveling around the country, there's huge variation on this very small island. Between the western seaboard, a line up from Clare right up to Donegal, and I did make that trip compared to the southeast of the country, Wexford in particular, parts of Kilkenny, parts of my own county, Tipperary. Um, you think you were on a different uh, planet almost. So the challenge is to help farmers, as we see it, to help farmers manage a difficult situation that some of them will be in over the winter. We have clear sets of protocols in place to help farmers stretch uh, the fodder in the, in the, in the, in the drying off period. Um, and we believe with careful proper management, um, farmers can get through the winter. That's our view. Now, I, I would say there is an issue that I'm quite concerned about, Chairman and, and Deputy, um, it relates to this is unlikely to be a once-off event, right? Because that's one of the predictions of climate change, is that these kind of episodes will be more frequent and they do occur 
uh, they will be more severe. So we have to, we're sitting down now with our research colleagues and saying, how do we need to adjust the kind of recommendations around the, the farm model, which is most resilient, given that kind of expectation that these events will be more Can I ask that, you know, the push is on for the to 2020 to 2025 and to increase, increase and produce more, more. Uh, are, we, are we pushing farmers to the extent, of, particularly in the dairy industry, that there, we have too much stock and we, have, we haven't the capacity, yeah. particularly with climate change and the weathers we're, we're meeting now and the difference in climate change and the seasons have changed, are we pushing too much uh, without thinking about the consequences of it's all right having three and four hundred cows and up, up the cows, but to carry and, and to uh, nurture them cows and make sure they have enough to, to buy for viability. Uh, are you worried about that? Um, I guess one fact should be pointed out there are fewer cows in the country now, fewer livestock than there were in the late 90s. That's a reality. What has clearly happened is expansion is taking place over a very short period of time, particularly in the dairy farms, in certain areas. We would be concerned because, and, and Chagas sometimes gets criticised, I you might say, I would say this unfairly, for advocating a, an unsustainable expansion strategy. We did nothing of the kind. We said time and time again to farms, look, look to your own farm gate first, improve your efficiency before you increase your cow numbers. Now that message doesn't always get across, particularly in a rapidly changing situation where farmers may have been used to providing fodder for 50, 60, 70 cows and they're doubling their cows over a couple of years and they just took a chance. We're saying it's time to pull back, look at improving your grassland. We still have the situation, deputies are well aware, where on dairy farmers the average utilisation of grass is only 7 tonnes a hectare. The capacity, and we know this from Pasture Base Ireland now, we're able to track grass growth all over the country, is double that. So we're it trying might, to... It might work this year with the drought, particularly... No, the, uh, but if farmers years. had been up to capacity, right, before the drought and before this year, in producing to what is possible, like this, we can double grass production on, on most farms, and, and Pasture Base Ireland has demonstrated that. We have a Grass 10 programme, it's a four-year programme supported by the Minister and a number of other private uh, companies as well involved in that. And we're focusing all our efforts around efficiency. But if a farmer clearly is not capable of generating the efficiency in terms of grass production for the stock that he and that is not that he has on farm, that is not a sustainable position. And that's the clear message that we're trying to send out. But I admit it can be difficult at times to get across that message. Can I just ask you for on stock? Can I ask you the, the suckler herd and the decline of the suckler herd and you know the viability of, of a suckler, especially suckler's beef? Uh, could you pass any comment on, on you know, the decline and you know get young farmers to, to actually continue in suckling and to make it viable? Um, I think I think uh, you know livelihood and uh, the amount of that's realised out suckler to beef now is is, is is hard hard to survive. And uh, what's your comment on that as, as well, research? As a you're research. absolutely right, Deputy. Uh, the income levels uh, from suckler farming are, without the basic payment scheme, uh, just farmers couldn't survive. Uh, the typical income from the Nas Chagas National Farm Survey on a suckler farm is about 10,000. Family farming is about 10,000 euro, and that's including uh, mainly, that involves mainly the, the basic payment to the farmer. So clearly there's a viability issue. When you analyse the problem, um, it's not difficult to explain why it's at that level, because you have quite a spread of people engaged in suckler farm. Very few of them would be full-time commercial type farmers. A lot of them are elderly people who probably are stepping down maybe from a career in dairying or maybe in fattening of animals or whatever, and they like to be involved in, in farming. Some of them are, a lot of them are part-time farmers, where it's, they're not dependent on the income uh, from their suckler enterprise for uh, their livelihoods. Um, and so it's a very challenging area, and, and there is no escaping the fact this has not happened today or yesterday. I'm in this business a fair long time now at this stage, and we've always had this problem within the suckler industry. Now, the, the fattening sector is a little better, but you know it's highly variable. Um, but the suckler industry has a huge difficulty. What we're trying to emphasise here is 
that we can have a win-win pathway for dry stock farmers if, uh, from dairy. But it's going to take a while, I think, for a mindset change. For example, there's huge opportunities now for farmers, dry stock farmers, who are expert people at managing cattle and herding and so on, to rear young animals. And there's already a small number of farmers engaging in that, and they're doing very well. There's also opportunities, in our view, for um, which was much more common prior to the dairy quota, for farmers to fatten uh, animals coming off the dairy herd. We have far fewer animals now coming off the dairy herd, for example, beef animals, than we had uh, pre-dairy pre quota. There are opportunities there, and I think rather than this false antagonism between dairy and the rest, I should think we should be trying to see how can we uh, complement income earning opportunities uh, as dairying is moving forward. Can I ask you just a, a general opinion on the genomic scheme? You know, there's a lot of farmers, particularly the continental, the, the, uh, the Shirley Railroad, that are saying the genomic scheme is destroying the, the animal that they're going for the small, lean animal that's uh, 22 months uh, beef and 24 months beef. Uh, and they maintain that the big honest animal that we had years ago, and that the, particularly the continentals. Can I ask you, what, what's your opinion on the genomic scheme? Well, I. Research on it and. Look, I suppose you wouldn't surprise me to hear me saying this. I, I think uh, it's a really, really important scheme because uh, I would say alongside uh, the improvements in, in grassland efficiency and efficient of grassland use, the second, the second biggest area where we have made substantial advances in this country in, in the agriculture sector has been the, on the breeding of animals. We can see the huge benefits in um, in the dairy industry by promoting the EBI. The, the difficulty when it comes, comes to the, the beef animals is a much more heterogeneous group, types of breeds and so on, but the principle is the same. And what the Beef Data Genome Scheme does, it provides us with the hard information to enable us to improve the efficiency of the breeding indices. Look, it's the one area, and I'm sure Deputy you're aware of this, that you get most discussion and it's often sometimes very emotional, virulent at times, is around breeding. <coughs> the science is very clear. The breeding index is based on science. It's not based on the look of an animal. And it is, in my view, through the beef data genomic scheme, while it will take longer, it's the pathway, in my view, towards improving the quality of, uh, of the beef herd. Very much so. Yeah. I just want to move on to Brexit. I couldn't mention the white elephant in the, in the room, as they say. What's your opinion? Are we prepared for Brexit? And we know we don't know really what's going to happen in Brexit yet. But how are we prepared, as particularly the agricultural community, are, are, and it's going to have a bigger effect on the agricultural community than on any, any, any other section in, in, in Ireland? Um, are we prepared? In your opinion, are we prepared for it, or are there going to be serious consequences on whatever comes out of Brexit? Well, obviously, like everyone in the country, uh, none of us know what exactly the format of breakfast, Brexit will, will be. Um, in terms of Changas' responsibilities, and obviously we work very closely with the department and Board B in particular, our responsibility is, is, uh, relates to what I call the innovation agenda. But we also have a responsibility because we have a capability in our economic division in analysing the economic impacts of Brexit as affects the dairy sector. And we were the first to produce a comprehensive analysis two years ago on the impact of the so-called hard Brexit option. And look, we all are aware of the devastating consequences <coughs> it would have. In terms of, of, of actions to combat Brexit, again, we've been focusing on, as I say, on identifying opportunities for innovation. And um, because we think if there is a silver lining in Brexit, it's going to be the opportunities presented and the drive to market diversification. And that's a positive thing. Um, and most of the markets that uh, are being identified are outside of Is Europe. Is that happening now, though? Are we, are we prepared now? Or are, oh, well, are we waiting for it to happen and didn't try to catch no, up? I, well, uh, look, I'm not 100% involved in this, but I'm aware that companies are actively engaged in, first of all, securing their UK markets and, and uh, entrenching customer loyalty there. And a number of companies, indeed, are building facilities, as you know, and expanding facilities in the UK. 
We're very interested, for example, in the potential that lies in, in Asian markets, uh, Southeast Asia in particular. Um, and it's going to require innovation. And I give you one, the one example I always give is the, the outlook for cheddar. We're hugely dependent on the UK market. I think 70% of our cheddar exports go to the UK. I often say Ireland and the British like cheddar, the Continentals don't take too kindly to cheddar. Um, while other cheeses can be produced on a cheddar platform, one of the areas that we're looking at in conjunction with a number of companies is to see can we identify a, a cheese that could be built off a cheddar platform which would be of interest to the Chinese consumer. Uh, so now that's a long haul. Hopefully we'll have a significantly, sufficiently long uh, transition period to enable us to bring forward these kind of new products that are going to have to be there. The farmer is in a more difficult position because a farmer can't take up his farm and relocate to the UK and they're in a different position and very vulnerable. But again, insofar as we can be of assistance, we would be saying it's all the more reason to promote and develop and implement efficiency improvement on farms. That's the key message that we're trying to get across. I just want to move on to farm safety. Um, in 2000, last year, 16 deaths again, and tragically, and uh, I just was chagged do you do courses on farm safety and have you uh, spent monies on, on yes. trying to you know, uh, s stop this happening and for safety reasons and education or whatever reasons that's why these tragedies are happening? Unfortunately, it does happen. It continues to happen. Just want to ask your opinion on yeah. farm safety. No, look, farm safety is, is something that uh, is very much part of our remit uh, through our advisory service, but we also do a significant amount of research on the causes of, of farm accidents. And not indeed just uh, focusing on mortality, the wider issue of farmer health is something that uh, we've been looking at in recent years. Um, we, we have the, the, the way we're set up is um, we have a, a specialist advisor dedicated completely to farm safety. And that person is responsible, first of all, for training up our own advisors around the country. We have about 280 frontline advisors. That person is responsible for making sure that they're up to speed on all the latest thinking in regard to uh, the reduction of, of accidents on farms. And that person also um, makes sure that all discussion groups, for example, uh, that farm safety is on the agenda of all discussion groups on a regular basis. We're in the process of recruiting a second um, uh, specialist because we think the, the workload has become quite onerous for the, uh, the specialists. Now, they work in collaboration with our, our frontline advisors. Everything we do in farm safety is in partnership with the Health and Safety Authority, and we work hand in glove with them in terms of, for example, we have um, a farm safety course that uh, we deliver in conjunction with the Health and Safety Authority, um, and that's produced on an annual basis, and farmers do sign up for that. Um, the problem we've identified, however, along with the Health and Safety Authority, is that um, awareness is one thing. It's getting farmers to do the things that they know they should be doing is the challenge. And that's why we've been looking very closely at uh, research in terms of behavioural change. What is the underlying behaviour that causes a man or woman to do something on the farm that they know is hazardous? There's a particular concern at the moment, Deputy, with elderly farmers. And unfortunately, a lot of the tragic accidents in recent times uh, with livestock and with machinery have been down to very old farmers, some very old now, I'm talking 80 plus, um, tragically dying in tractor overturns or with uh, animals, with livestock. Uh, and there's a reason for that. Uh, we think it's pretty obvious. A lot of the young people are getting jobs off farm. They're leaving the management of the farm maybe to their elderly, elderly relative. And that's a particular area that we want to focus on. And finally, I would say we do work very closely, obviously, with the department, with a number of uh, bodies like FBD have a major farm safety program. We work very closely with them. We work very closely with the, with the committees within the farm organisations. Um, but we've been talking about this for a long, long time. And still, unfortunately, the statistics uh, are moving in the wrong direction. And uh, I... 
don't know what the answer is, Deputy. I'll be okay, quite frank. Just one last question, then, Chairman. This is the last question, because I know I'm over my time. So just, uh, there's an increase of 403,000 there on travel and subsistence. It, yes. seems, it seems an awful lot of money in one year of an increase. Um, uh, you know, why that kind of money of an increase? The question mark over that, and even the controller of the general mentioned it there in, in his, in his uh, opening speech. Yes, it seems um, an awful lot of money. Like, what's it for? Can you identify? Is it, are they trips abroad? Are they? Are they? Can you, are, there, are there many trips? Are they you know, personally going abroad or going to where? Can, well, you, can you explain it? There is a breakdown there between domestic and, and foreign trip. The foreign trips would be a relatively small component of that. The increase is, is I suppose, substantially due to. Um, uh, I think the increase actually was eight percent by my reckoning. Which is well, it's 403,000. I watched it. Yeah, it's about 400, but, but it's 8%. Um, there was, we got a, first of all, there was an improvement in subsistence rates for a start um, and that had been fixed for a number of years and they, and they improved. So that's, that's a significant contribution. Secondly, of course, we, we, have a few, few, we have some more staff, and all of our uh, travel and subsistence is driven by activity levels on farms. And uh, this year, uh, or last year rather, and the same will be true this year, uh, we, we have been engaging in more on-farm visits, which gives rise to extra expenses, largely because of the fodder situation. We've, um, and we've actually, uh, in regard, in the, uh, a point I should make as well is that, while we have 45,000 clients, when it comes to, comes to the fodder advice, we are giving advice to non-clients as well, so that's another reason. And as regards the foreign trips are concerned, um, we what, do, what do these foreign trips entail? Well, typically, for example, uh, if I take my own case, I, I was recently on a visit to uh, Colombia on the invitation of the Department of Foreign Affairs. Now, uh, um, and uh, we were looking at, on foot of the President's visit there last year, uh, it was uh, identified that Chagas may be able to advise on how we could help the farmers transition, transition from the FARC-dominated violence in some of the regions. We, a lot of the other trips would be directly related to uh, research, because we're involved in research all over the world at this stage, but substantially in Europe. Um, we would have joint research projects. We might win a project, for example, from the European Union and that there will be partners in other countries and that we would have to meet up with them or we have to meet in Brussels. So a lot of our activity has become increasingly international. So that year on year, that's another factor. But I want to assure you, uh, Deputy, uh, every item of expenditure is rigorously assessed and whenever there is, an, there is an increase like this, we always in the authority and the audit committee will always review the reasons uh, for that as you have just asked. Okay, Chairman. Okay, next speaker then is Deputy Catherine Connolly, and we'll try and do okay, 10 then. in the slots. If yeah, you're very welcome. And, uh, do I you're all very welcome. It's very interesting. And I do agree with one thing, this huge diversity, huge diversity in the country. I've just come back from North Mayo on an Irish committee and we sat there all day and um, I can tell you they the feel that they're forgotten. So I might come back to that in terms of your rural program in a minute. Just in terms of governance. Chagas has, has a board of directors or an authority, is that right? Yes. Okay. And on that there are 10? 10, 10? There are 11. 11, including the chairperson. Including the chair. They're appointed by the minister. Yes. And, they're, and they serve a five year term. Yes. And is there provision to serve a second year term? Yes. As well? Okay. Uh, it, it, the, the minister can, at his discretion, renew the term for another five years. And then another five years? No. Maximum yeah. two, five, Absolutely, two yeah. five years. And are there any vacancies on that at the moment? Uh, there, um, there is, uh, yeah. as of now, there's one vacancy yeah. because the department uh, representative has been promoted to secretary general. Okay. And uh, we hope that will be filled in a short period of time. Okay. And do you, do you sit on that authority? I, I attend, but I'm not a director. You're not a director? No. Okay. And, and then just the gender representation. It would be remiss of me not to comment no. on it. There's a great absence of gender representation on that board. There are two, um, two women on That's the board. Right. Yeah. And I, I would have to agree with you, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, hmm? two, two out, two of, out 11. of 11. Yeah. It's yeah. not satisfactory. No. And so what steps are you taking in relation well, to that? Well, 
Look, uh, we don't make the nominations. Uh, and, but the department, I know. Uh, we go back to the. Uh, well, the men do, I think, do they? In this case? Well, no, I, I take that back, and then I leave it for the minister. Okay, okay. I just, yeah. I just highlight it. But, I, I highlight uh, it because earlier on we had discussions, not today, about where does this come in for value for money, and clearly gender representation will bring more value for money. We know there's any amount of studies in relation to that. But anyway, I just I leave that as it is. Just in relation to governance, and uh, um, first of all, congratulations, you got a clean audit, and that's that's good. In relation to uh, the Audit and Risk Committee, that's set up, that's sitting, isn't that right? Yes. And it has met on a number of occasions, and it's all set out here. There's just one specific question in relation to, I, th I think the chairperson of the board said uh, he had set up um, internal audit control. Just, when was that set up? We, we have it in, like all organisations, we have an internal uh, auditor. Yes. And a whole system there that has been established for several years. But that's what I just want to clarify with yes. you now. Uh, just when, when I want it, I can find it. But everything on paper is looking good. The, in, the committee meets the Audit and Risk Committee, and it's documented that it reached. But then I saw a comment that the chairperson of the board has set up internal audit controls. So it just begged the question, when were they set up? He didn't give a date. Well, I think that, that may be in a, a misunderstanding. The, the, the yeah. internal audit system is the executive yes. support to the audit. Committee. Yeah, oh, no, I understand all that. Yeah. We, but that, no, that's been in place. I mean, I'm 11 years in the job, so. Uh, yeah, well, I'll tell you where I got it from, page 73. Uh, Chagas has an audit and risk committee, and the audit and risk committee met four times. Chagas has also established an internal yeah. audit function, has also established, yes. which is adequately res resourced and conducts a programme of work agreed. So that just caught my eye. They have established, and yeah. when was it established? No, I mean, I think it might be... Um, Just the way it's written? Would have been, it's not phrased very well. Okay. It's, uh, to be honest with you, it's been established for as long as I can remember. That's okay. Um, and uh, we certainly revise that. I can see why you might get yeah, that impression. That's okay. Yeah. Well, just in, it, it's relative to other organisations, one very recently, where yeah. there was no internal audit function, oh, no. even though on paper... Believe you me, yeah. uh, Deputy, we have well, I don't a want really to, I, strange... Yeah. I'd like to believe you, but I prefer to see it on paper. No, but no, thank no. you, and I see it on paper. Yeah. Just in in relation to uh, uh, page 47, the National Chagas National Farm Survey. Yes. Uh, very interesting information, and again, thank you. Is that the total number of farms? 84,599 farms. It, it represents uh, the actual. It's a it's a sample. I saw that the sample is 800. <coughs> yeah, and it represents that number of that farms. That number. That's yeah. the total number of yeah. farms. And again, I see a huge range, and 35% of farms earned less than 10,000. Yeah. Can you just explain the regional analysis for me, and I'll tie it back into North Mayo on page 47. The regional. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's just I have a difficulty with the colour coding myself. I just, I'm not. Farm viability. 30% of farms are vulnerable. Are we on that page, sorry? Yes, yes, yeah. I see it. 43% uh, are viable, 27% are sustainable. Yeah. Well, we have particular definitions. Um, uh, viable. Farms are uh, basically our farms generating sufficiently in sufficient income from their farming activity yeah. uh, to keep going, so to speak. Yeah. And um, the second category there, sustainable, yeah. would also take into account, uh, in addition to their commercial income and to the <coughs> basic payment scheme, if they have an off-farm job, for instance, or the family has an off-farm job. Which 31% yeah, of the farmers We would work. argue they would yeah. be sustainable. And then the vulnerable are the people that fall into the last category, people that maybe there would be, um, they don't have an off farm job, typically they would be elderly, mm. they might have a very low income from their farming activity. What percentage is in the west of Ireland? We I, take Galway, take Mayo. I don't have that figure immediately is, no, available. That's okay. Would it be possible to get those figures? Well, yes, we can get you that. Okay. Um, a breakdown of the counties yeah. in the west. Probably not by county basis because the sample numbers would be small okay. at that level. But I would uh, hazard that most of them are in that, uh, in those areas. Okay. And if we come back then to, um, Just yeah. to the secretary, yes. yeah. yeah. If we come back to your. Um, Actually, just, I'm going to go through your mission statement there in terms of rural, rural economy and development. But what was your purpose in drawing attention to? Um, 
the fact that you can't borrow is it you're, you, you, you're not allowed to go into an overdraft situation and you're not allowed to borrow and you wrote I think well I don't know why I got two statements two two opening statements but sorry one the longer one was meant to be briefing statement oh that's very good no it was it was a very helpful but you point on that one the last goal is especially relevant to today's proceedings yes to uh, enhance organisational ability. Yeah, it, just in relation to the money, do, do you believe you should be able to borrow money? Was that your purpose in raising it today? And if so, what changes have to be made? Well, under the under the Act, Act the established Chagas yeah. Deputy, yeah. we are permitted yes. to, to borrow, right. uh, but it has to be with the agreement of the two departments. I see. And so far they've said no. No, oh, and they have good sound reasons. Oh, that's okay. I just wanted to clarify that yeah. for myself. That's okay. So if we just go back to the west of Ireland now, and I was up there all day on Monday, and it, it, it was a tale of neglect from, and we met solidly from half past nine in the morning till half past seven, various groups, cooperatives on the ground and various groups. And, and their words were, we feel we're forgotten. So when I look at your, and very good stuff, I have to say, but when I look at it, and you, one of the major, one of it, encourage diversification of the rural economy and enhance the quality of life in rural areas. Rural economy and development. Can you just zone in on that for me as to how you do that in term, on a fair basis, on an equitable basis? I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by equitable. How, how do you, we'll take, North, we'll take North of Mayo, it's not my area, I'm not interested in votes, but it's North Mayo, they feel they're forgotten. Would you, and I looked at your map, um, you don't have in up North Mayo, there's no advisory centre. Yeah. So. Do you look, I mean, I can pick West Clare, I can pick yes. West Clare, I can pick areas in Connemara, I was trying not to be parochial. Sure. Yeah, so how do you work that out to fulfil your objective in relation to rural development? Well, look, I, I'm actually, in my own background in rural development, that was where I did all, most yeah. of my earlier research work. Yeah. Um, the... We, we don't operate on a regional basis. In other words, we, we don't have a plan for each county in terms of activities. But, but how do you operate to fulfil that objective? What we do is it's, yeah. through, it's through our series of programmes. For example, in, uh, the most important um, driver of rural development, um, in our view, is to having viable family farms. That, that filters down into yeah. uh, the rural community if we can establish solid uh, income earning farms. So that's the first requirement. So in that part of the world, um, and it's very similar to where I live myself, I live in a very in a relatively remote and challenging area. Yeah. Uh, we would be emphasising there, for example, the work we do on in sheep, uh -huh. sheep production. That's right. And we have a very active programme underway involving both research at our site in Athen Rye um, and we would try and promulgate the messages coming out of that um, from Athen Rye. We would also we also have a better what we call a better uh, sheep program, which is an advisory program, which involves selecting a number of farms around the country, um, which uh, can demonstrate uh, how commercial yeah. sheep production can be enhanced. Yeah. <laughs> Similarly, in beef, for example. I committed to establishing a beef demonstration farm in the west of Ireland. We've located one for a number of years now in Athen Rye. So again, that demonstrates to farmers in those regions how um, they can improve their income earning activity. Now on top of that, uh, a big part of this program here is around uh, succession planning and assisting farmers in moving on the farm from one generation to the next. Can, can I just stop you there, Professor? I, 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 I think maybe a better way for me to deal with this is to pursue it afterwards and maybe talk to the Chagas officials because I'm going to run out of time and I'm conscious, I haven't actually used up my time, but I'm just conscious okay. that two more speakers need to come in. But certainly the perception on the ground in some rural areas is that they're being forgotten. And I just wonder where Chagas could take a proactive mm -hmm. approach to that. So maybe that I'll come back to, because I wanted to deal with just a couple of practical things and also climate change and I, I'm looking at the mitigation plan and actually I, I'm heartened what you said about the trajectory of dairy farming um, 
that, that is contradictory with the, the aims that we need that we need to meet under climate change. Is that correct, or am I at the present time? At the yes. present time. Yes. So, just in terms of the mitigation plan, and we fought a long battle to get this legislation, which is there. We're clearly falling. We're not meeting our targets under climate change legislation generally. So has a team been set up in Chagas in, in relation to climate change, monitoring the targets set out in the mitigation plan? Because again, I looked at your annual statement and Brexit got two pages and Brexit is extremely important. But also along with risks, there are opportunities with Brexit. With climate change, we're in serious trouble. And I think there's a half a page on it in your report. So just judging on that, um, can you outline for me where I will find more info? Sorry, what actions you're taking under the mitigation plan? Well, in terms of actions, uh, as I said, we have a very active research programme on, on climate change. So, have you a dedicated team? Oh, yes, we have. Yeah. Oh, we, how, many, we have a, how many is on the team? Well, um, we have a research department, first of all, on, uh, dedicated to this, and um, there would be several people involved in different aspects of the. You know, the climate change is, it overlaps a I number know. of skills, like, you know, we have soils yeah. people, we have water people. No, I, I understand that, and we're listening to that at government level yeah. all the time. So we, 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 we have just, that. No, just that it crosses all departments, I accept that. No, but we have a department With, within, specifically. Yeah, no, just the risk for me at political level is, not you now, but when it's across all departments that really nobody's taken charge. Yeah. So what I'm asking in relation to Chagas, which is on the ground, and you're telling me there is a research Oh team. yeah, we have a research yeah. and we have a knowledge transfer team dedicated okay. to sustainability, yeah. which includes um, the carbon and, and water and biodiversity and so on. I guess one output, and you can get yeah. this on our website, yeah. the most recent output we would have produced, we also have an internal working group, very yes. large working group, drawn from all of the organisations. Yeah. We have two of them actually, one is climate change yeah. and one is water. Um, the climate change group would have produced this report that I referred uh, earlier in my response to uh, Deputy Deering, yeah. it's called the Marginal Abatement Cost Curve, a bit of a mouthful uh, yeah. report. That's on our website, MACC, we call yeah. it the MAC for short. That is the culmination of the most recent uh, analysis and reflection on climate change. I suppose what I'm asking you just for a moment, this time next year, if I look, and you're before us if we're here, and I look at, you're the lead authority for a number of the actions under the mitigation plan. Will I be able to see a report from you saying we've met that, or we haven't met it, or we're on target, or we're not on target? Will we see that kind of... Okay, well, I definitely will uh, ensure that there's more uh, material on climate change to reflect what we're actually doing. As I say, this plan, this MAC curve, it really is the culmination of all the work we have been doing in recent no, no, years. I, honestly, I understand that, and I don't yeah. mean to be... Uh, no, I would imagine, yes. yes. I, I, I would be happier with yeah. accountability. We, you're saying that climate change isn't that visible. It's extremely visible. Maybe I picked you up wrong earlier on. It's extremely visible. We see it practically every day. So plans have been set under pressure, objectives, and I would like to see ye as the lead authority saying, this, we've met this, we haven't yes. met this, and we're doing it. I think there's a need for that. That's a fair point. Yeah. There is yeah. one uh, area where that is the case. Yeah. Um, as you know, under food harvest and food wise, yeah. we had there is an implementation committee chaired by the minister, which meets I think every six weeks or so, and all of the actions there and are clearly set out and uh, achievements are otherwise. Okay. So that is um, that is done okay. in that context. Okay. And finally, just if you look just practical things on page 94 of your accounts, the financial charges. Page 94. Now, if, if the other speakers are going to cover these, I'll stop and let them know. Financial charges. There's a big jump between 16 and 17 for financial charges. It's going from, I think, 95,000 up to 439,000. Can you clarify those financial charges for me? I don't know what they are, so I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure now um, exactly okay. what they are, but. What I can say in relation to financial charges, um, our charges have increased and um, the, um, de where we had in the past earned some deposit interest at the yeah. bank when we had funds in the bank now, um, that's becoming more okay. difficult. Could we, get a chair through the, sorry, could we get a note on that because it's, yeah. there's a significant yeah. difference. Yeah. Sig yeah. And then in relation to private colleges. Yes. Can I finish on this chair? Am I in trouble? Yeah, sorry. Okay. Okay. The private colleges. Uh, yes. The grants to private colleges. Yes. Sa same page. Grants to private colleges, note 28. Yes. 
Can you explain that to me? There are three colleges. One is in my own county, Mount Elliot, yes. not in my area, but yeah. Could you just explain the rationale yeah. behind that? Well, uh, we, there are three colleges. Yeah. Uh, there is Gortine College, um, the Salesians run uh, Palace Kenry, and then the Franciscans run Mount Bellew. Yeah. And uh, they provide uh, education courses on behalf of Chagask in their communities. Yes. And Chagask has a requirement, therefore, to subvent uh, the staff at those colleges. Not all of the staff, but a substantial number of them. Yes. We also second staff directly, and they're obviously on our payroll, but that's a separate matter. We also are required uh, to, insofar as we can, to assist in the maintenance of those facilities, because the entities in question don't have the resources. So we, we supply a small amount of funding every year to, to help with basic maintenance. These are a hugely important resource for Chagask in delivering education across the country. I understand that, but just in terms of governance and monitoring of it, how is that? What is well, the we, have a, we have a service level agreement, for okay. example, with all of the colleges. Yeah. And that's the main mechanism through which both the Audit Committee in Chagask <laughs> and the Chagas Authority are satisfied that um, uh, governance is appropriate because obviously we treat them, we try to make sure that they're run on the very same basis okay. as the overall Chagas programs okay. are run. Okay, I have many more questions, but I'll stop. Um, I'm in time. Uh, Deputy Connell and Burke, we'll, we've said we'll finish before the vote. You know. um, you spoke there, Professor, earlier about um, somebody asked you about building up capital reserves and you sold assets in 2016 and um, I'm just wondering how sustainable is that going forward selling assets to fund um, daily operations and you use the phrase that this money will be ring fenced and only used as needed which seems to me to be contradictory that you'd ring fence something and only use it as needed perhaps you might clarify what you meant by that um, Regarding the wage bill, where two thirds of the total um, budget goes on pay and pensions, um, while I understand it's not the same model as any business, um, perhaps could somebody outline how does this compare internationally, perhaps with the UK, the equivalent in the UK? Um, is it normal to have two thirds of the total spend um, on pensions and wages? Um, the 18,000 hectares of land um, owned. Can someone give me a percentage which is in forestry? Um, I think one of you mentioned some was in forestry. And is that managed by Quitcha or by yourselves, or who's it managed by? Um, one of the previous speakers asked about who, who decided what assets to sell. I don't think we got an answer on that. Um, so if someone could maybe, I think we were, we were talking about the Concealy site. So who prioritises, um, like in the rationalisation programme, who, who prioritised um, what, what lands should be disposed of? And is, that, is there a list of, of that anywhere, um, of those assets? Um, regarding the fodder crisis, which we've had um, a number of incidents in the last year, um, Many of the EU directives are far, like you farm by calendar, and we had uh, um, during the summer at the start of the very good weather in July um, in areas of Ireland, definitely over the west and the midlands compared to the Golden Vale, um, many farmers um, wanted to cut hay early. Now, as it turned out, the weather stayed good longer than anticipated, and it all worked out in the end. But perhaps your view um, on the wisdom of farming by calendar while on the other hand speaking about erratic um, climate incidences. So it doesn't, to me, make sense that you would have rigid time frames for cutting silage or cutting hay or spreading slurry or any of those activities. But then on the other hand, going well, weather changes and I think it's, been, it's, it's unlikely to be a one-off, as one of, you, one of you said earlier. So just from so a farming point of view to the future, that incident caused a lot of stress on farmers um, over the summer months and worrying about their animals in the winter. And is there anything you can suggest we can do to mitigate perhaps some of, of that concern and, and worry? Um, you spoke about, and maybe I misinterpreted you, um, that most farms could double their grass output. Um, and obviously that would offset a fodder incident. 
um, could you perhaps give us some, um, some examples of, of how you're getting down to the grassroots farmers? I'm sure it's like anything, it's probably those that need it the most don't engage in the process, but perhaps you, you, you could um, um, speak to that. And just finally, with regard to your research facilities, six research facilities, um, I'd imagine um, that these area, the, these facilities have a lot, do a lot of work with disease control, um, testing. Um, do you do testing for other countries? Really, what I'm getting at here is how prepared are those research facilities for Brexit? Um, I'm sure there's cross-border relationships and perhaps relationships with the UK. If you could elaborate on that, thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Deputy. Just to, to clarify in relation to the. Uh, our attempts in recent years, our determination to build up a small capital reserve. This is really for cash flow purposes. It's just managing cash flow. I mean, the, we, we do not use them to, uh, we do not spend these resources on, on current expenditure. It's simply, it's just to manage the gap between the timing of doing the work and getting the income in. That's really the whole problem we have. Mm -hmm. Normally a company in this situation would have, would have overdraft facilities. So we, we don't have overdraft facilities. It's like a bridging loan. Yeah. So we, we have to look. As I say, it, it's it's we would far prefer to be using these resources for longer term capital requirements. Uh, but at the same time, we have to be prudent in relation to managing cash flow. So uh, at the present, this is the only way we see we can do that. Your question about pay and pensions. Um, I I don't have the comparable figure for international organisations. Uh, but my strong view would be, from my knowledge of these organisations, that we're very similar, because uh, a, re a research organisation is, is people heavy, so to speak. Um, it also, all of our research staff, for example, pretty much all of them would be uh, at PhD level, so they would tend to be on, on higher grade salaries relative to the rest of the public sector. So I'd be, uh, I, I would imagine, although I don't have the data, uh, at present, but um, that uh, certainly to the likes of INRA um, in, or to SRUC in Scotland or Rothamsted in the UK or any of these bodies, um, it would be very similar structure. Um, on the forestry area, I, we don't have that information, but I will get that for you. Um, uh, we would have forests on some of our, uh, our sites, and a lot of them actually, like in Moorpark, we'd have a small forest area around the periphery there on the Dungarvan road on Lismore Road, there's a forest there. We have significant forestry in, in Oak Park. You're probably aware, Deputy, a number of years ago, the Chagas Authority, with the consent of the government, uh, handed over uh, a forest and lake area as recreational, for recreational purposes to the people of Carlow. There was about 50 hectares or so involved in that, but we also have forest in sight. We have forest in Ballyhays, we have forest in Johnstone Castle. Um, uh, and in fact, we conduct a certain amount of research on those activities, but that's a figure that we will extract for you by sight. Mm -hmm. In relation to the question on who decides to sell the assets, well, the, the process is, is, is well set out. Uh, um, and during the rationalisation programme, uh, obviously, that came to a head. The management proposed, first of all, what we did was we proposed a series of criteria by which assets would be sold. Now that we were dealing with a particular challenging period in the financial history of the country, so there was an absolute necessity to rationalise and uh, that was the context. So management proposed first of all a series of criteria on which uh, say an advisory office would be closed and that included, as you might expect, uh, uh, the, the, the usage of the office by farmers, the number of farmers in the hinterland, all that kind of thing the state of, of, of the office itself in terms of uh, uh, the age of the office and so on. And uh, then the authority adopted the criteria following consultation. So then we came forward with a list of properties that were deemed suitable to sell. And the authority decided then on block and they stuck with that decision. Uh, because as you can imagine, Given the amount of offices we have around the country, it's a very difficult thing even to sell one office. Uh, but we managed to, by having a set of criteria, we managed to get buy-in 
for the entire an entire suite of rationalisation, including the sale of the of the, of the Kinsley offices, and that was the basis. And then, of course, that of course had to be approved subsequently, as I say, by the by the ministers. Um, you, you raise a very difficult question in, in relation to farming by calendar. I'd say the popular view among some farmers would be that yes, we should move to farming by calendar. And you might think that's a sensible way to go. Uh, but my colleagues, when they've looked at this, found that it can give rise to unexpected implications. It is not as straightforward as it might seem. I personally think that the current system, while it has uh, disadvantages, also from time to time, like this year is a good example, you know, the minister has been able to exercise flexibility in how it's implemented. So I think maybe we've got the best of both worlds. Because one thing that's very important here is there is at least certainty with the current system. People know exactly on what day they have to cease spreading story or what, and what day they can commence. Personally, I think that's useful for a lot of people. But if there's a crisis situation where those can, that doesn't make sense, then I think you need the flexibility. And I think, by and large, it has been demonstrated. So I'm really saying to you, I, I think there are a couple of ways you could you could view that um, issue. I don't think it's entirely straightforward. In regards to the point I made about the potential to grow grass, yes, you're absolutely correct, of course. It's a massive challenge. We, we track, it's one of our key KPIs, Productive adoption, that we, we track uh, each year, and we, we have a trend now. And uh, while there has been growth in grass utilisation, it's not been as we would have liked. It has grown over the last three or four years, uh, averaging out the extremes. Um, it's a huge puzzle because, for example, our research colleagues have estimated that every extra tonne of grass utilised is, is worth about €180 Euro for a dairy farmer per hectare and worth about €105 Euro for a beef farmer. What are we doing about it? Well, we have a number of programmes in place in recent years. For example, uh, we've invested a lot in developing a, a whole methodology for measuring grass. And in fact, I think on the front of our, our, our report, you will see an example, one of a photograph of, of uh, colleagues engaged in that activity. Um, we've set up um, a, a program called Pasture Base Ireland. And what this allows us to do is to track grass growth performance right out the, around the country. And uh, with that information, then, we can benchmark. So if you're a farmer in, say, West Tipperary, and you're interested in what your colleagues in East Limerick are doing, you can compare your performance with them. And benchmarking has proved to be a useful tool to improve performance. Um, that data now is published regularly. Uh, it's very like a weather map, and it's been very useful in the last year in particular in tracking the impact of the fodder situation, because obviously with the fodder, grass growth diminished particularly in the, during the drought. Um, so that's one tool. Um, we, this really is an example of precision agriculture at work in the dairy sector particularly, although the technology can be used elsewhere. Um, so we can learn a huge amount from that information. It's unique worldwide. In fact, we're talking to the New Zealanders and the Australians about using that technology. Hopefully they'll buy it off us. We also have a program uh, in place now to promote the utilisation of grass more aggressively. It's called GRASS-10. We're in the second year of a four-year programme. GRASS-10 10 stands for a target of 10 tonnes utilised grass per hectare. It's a little bit less ambitious than what I said, but uh, it's considered to be a reasonable target. And 10 also stands for the number of grazings that we would advocate farmers to conduct during the season because there's a high correlation between grazings and production and utilisation. That uh, is strongly supported by the department and it's also supported by a number of companies. Um, look, it's, I'd say it's the biggest challenge we face as an organisation is to persuade farmers to adopt these kind of technologies, and grass in particular. I'll give you an example. As I said, there's two main technologies 
that we've been promoting within Chagas. One is breeding technology, and there's been huge success, along with ICBF and along with the AI companies, um, the adoption of um, EIB for, uh, the EBI, for example, has been hugely successful. Uh, grassland has a massive challenge, and we, we, we haven't cracked yet how we can encourage farmers to make the transition to what is clearly in their, in their interest and also is hugely important from an environmental point of view. Your final question in relation to disease control, we don't have responsibility in that area. We do have responsibility in one dimension, in one aspect of food safety in particular. We do a lot of research around food safety uh, from our Ashtown site and we also are the national lab for the analysis of uh, residues in meat and uh, that's an area that obviously we liaise with the, the department on a, on a regular basis in, in regards to that. As far as the general economic diseases are concerned, we work very closely with um, Animal Health Ireland. That's where we come into, uh, so where we feature, uh, and of course with the department. And we, we have programs, joint programs underway, and indeed we subvent, um, we provide a contribution to the work of Animal Health Ireland to enable them to produce, uh, to recruit a, a technical officer. Deputy Borkin, because we're going to be up for time in a few minutes, so Deputy Bork, I know time is tight. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, uh, uh, um and I thank the witnesses for their attendance. Um, just a very brief few questions. Uh, just, first of all, I just want to be impressed in terms of when we couldn't get a detailed explanation for the financial charges in the accounts. I think when we have the head of finance here, the chief operations officer, you know, 362% of an increase is fairly substantial, and I think uh, we should be able to detail that in the accounts. Um, <clears throat> so that would disappoint me. Just in terms of your investment strategy, uh, first of all, a big a part of your model would be um, doing farm works, advising farmers in organic farming practices. Is that correct? Yes, a relatively small part. A small part. And that's I just wonder in terms of just squaring uh, that circle in terms of, I see you, you obviously have um, investments in private companies, ordinary shareholders from Glanbia, um, Curry Group, um, Lakeland in your business model and obviously their business model is to sell fertilizers is um, obviously it's a key part of that it's obviously as well to um, have animal remedies etc how do you safeguard your organization to promote uh, organic farming when um, you're in theory benefit benefiting from share dividend and investments in private companies that part of their business model contradicts that somehow yeah, uh, just, just to be clear, I mean, uh, the reason we have those investments, Cahirlach, is because we supply milk from several farms around the country and then we automatically receive shares on foot of that. So it's not that we go out and actually right. seek to invest actively in these companies. It, it's yeah, and how that, do you safeguard then? No, yeah, and I know that that's a very good point. Um, and in fact, I would add to that just to, to complement that point. Uh, we have a number of what we call joint programmes with virtually all of the co-ops in the country, all the dairy co-ops, where we jointly agree a program of advisory activity. Um, we, we, we pride ourselves on our independence. Um, and we ensure in the, in the contracts that we draw with all of those co-ops. And it arises specifically and directly in relation to what we call the joint programs. We agree to, we, we will only agree to a program of activity which absolutely does not compromise our independence. And again, the process goes through the internal uh, uh, committee, the advisory and research committee of the. And do you have to accept shares in terms of for the sale of milk? Have you not a choice in that? I, I don't think so. Uh, as far as I'm aware, no, I don't, no, we don't have a choice. I mean, every farm that supplies milk gets part of the deal, you know. Uh, I know, but this is different to farmers, the state organisation yeah. obviously, and that's where I just, yeah. um, I would yeah. be concerned. But that doesn't, that. Uh, Chairman, I want to be very clear about this, in no way does that compromise. I've given you the example of a situation where we have, separate to those, we have these joint programmes, where we draw up a specific contract with, with the same co-ops uh, in relation to, say, it might be improvement in protein on farms, it might be reducing carbon footprint, whatever it might be. And um, but you're right, it is a challenging issue. 
very challenging, and it's something that we would repeatedly discuss at the full authority level. And always the question comes back to, I will be asked by the chairman, by the members of the authority, are you absolutely sure that your independence is not compromised? Just in terms of um, your livestock, uh, uh, just from the holding you have in, in the accounts, um, I was just uh, noting that um, your stock obviously did increase by over 20%, but the mortality rate of livestock and the value went up by 73%. Uh, so it seems in terms of uh, a significant enough increase in terms of stock that, uh, that, that died on the holdings. Is there any reason for that? Or? No, um, we can provide uh, detailed mortality figures by farms. As I say, we have several farms around the country. Um, we, would, um, we certainly perform exceptionally well in terms of mortality rates. We would have to. Mm -hmm. as an but it's a big increase. If you look in terms of like your stock increase from uh, by roughly around 24 and a half percent odd, um, but your mortality rate seems to be creeping up. It's up at four percent there now of total um, would, total stock. And in terms of the value, it, it's just a little bit disproportionate there in terms of the value. Is there any detailed reason for that, or? I wouldn't be uh, I wouldn't be aware of any. I I would consider that uh, significant change, you know, as I say, our mortality. That particular year, livestock values went up dramatically because of the market situation, naturally enough. You know, it was a very good year for dairy and so on. Um, but the mortality... But naturally, um, they're, they're obviously, I imagine breeding stock are obviously uh, held at a reduction of cost for, for um, an accounting figure, so you imagine values shouldn't really impact on that figure. And also, if you're breeding a new stock in, it shouldn't, because it's not, it's, um, it's not that it hit the marketplace as yet. If you don't mind, I'll ask for my head of yeah. finance to deal with that. We, uh, we, do, we value the stock at a uh, market value set out in our accounting policy. I'm just looking for the, the page here. Um, yes, yeah, so on page 89 there it sets out um, livestock uh, at the bottom of the page there, um, 2.11 inventory, livestock and own farm produce are valued at fair value model. Fair value is determined on the basis that animals are sold on the open market. Gains and losses which arise from these valuations are reflected in full in operational income. So that's not really explaining so what happened though. Yeah. But anyway, I can... Um I can move on. Just in terms of, um, you, you said you have um, service level agreements with uh, private third level colleges for any uh, monies paid. Just on page 78, in terms of, um, of the annual report, there, there's 175,000 euro for tax advice. Just wondering what's the nature of that advice? Uh, if you don't mind, I'll ask for Head of Finance to talk. Yeah. Is that okay, Chairman? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah um, we do. Um, we have uh, we avail of the the services of uh, of a tax expert um, to get advice on uh, a range of tax matters, including um, VAT compliance um, issues around sales of properties. Um, issues around um, the various types of um, activities that we're involved in, a range of activities which have different um, VAT status. So our research activities are um, advisory services provided to farmers compared to our advisory services provided to um, the Department of Ag or corporate entities and so forth. There's, um, tax compliance is uh, is a very high priority in Chagas, so so we do avail of expert advice to ensure that we maintain compliance. Now there will be some other um, financial advice that we would take from time to time. That figure wouldn't be entirely um, tax advice, but tax would be a, a main component of it. And would that be considered high for that uh, year? Um, yeah, it has been, it's higher, I would say, in recent years than it would have been in the past, but um, compliance, um, you know, seems to become ever more onerous, so, um, yeah. Uh, and in, in consultancy there as well, the 345, is that, um, what's that, the nature of that then? Uh, I have. On the same page. Yeah, I have some detail on that here. Um, mm -hmm. Just bear with me for a moment. So, uh, 
in that 345 that includes um, there was 19,000 on consultancy on Moodle which is an educational um, tool in a college and um, there was uh, some work done by an external agency on mean test, means testing of student grants uh, there was an evaluation done of our library service um, there was um, payments to UCD and UCC um, for some expertise that we availed of. Uh, there was spend on consultants um, associated with uh, the project in Johnstown Castle to uh, develop a, a tourism uh, centre in the, the castle, which was formerly used for research, but it's not um, really appropriate for that use. Uh, there was... Um, uh, some of the spend was on uh, organising international conferences and um, various other things. So there's a, a range of issues included in that. Chairman, we, we have the detail. With here, so we, we can make that available yeah. directly and just, after the meeting. Thanks very much. And just finally, um, just in relation to um, overtime, we're saying there that uh, the highest payment was something like 23,000 to one individual. One individual, I think it's on page 96 there, note 9. Um, and in terms of your recording system, how do you record overtime? Have you uh, a computerised system or what way is that carried out? And would you consider that very significant in terms of... Um, that particular case there, which is identified, is due to uh, milking, uh, someone who is on call for milking activities. Uh, over the weekend, and uh, that's why that arises. And well, he's contracted out to farmers. With farmers no, 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 it's oh, sorry. Oh, it's, it's your own making. Oh yeah, it's our own. own it's our own staff who have to do milking, and so. It's I thought payment. that should be easy to manage in terms of for a basic core salary for milking. Like you know, when cows have to be milked, it's not something that you know changes. It's not well, irregular. I should say that this individual is on a very low salary, and uh, it's not. So a salary level isn't reflective of, of the work he's doing? Uh, well, it's, he, it's he's, basic salary. he's a milker. It's a very, very low salary. And uh, when you take that into account on top of the, uh, the overtime. And is he the one individual then that's anywhere near the rate of 22, 23,000 that we've seen in the previous year? Is that one individual each year? I think it's the same person. Isn't that right? I think so, yeah. yeah it's the same and there's no, no one else near that figure, no? near that figure. I don't, I don't have the distribution of... Uh, he was certainly the outstanding one that we drew to your attention but, um, in the report. We can certainly get the distribution. That's OK, Chairman. Better go to vote. There's not many of them in that situation. Thank you, Deputy Burke. I'll just proceed with a few questions. I know the vote is on, but i just carry on. So will all the members put the questions? I'll ask just some other ones. <clears throat> and yeah, just to complete the process. One thing, and it was touched on, I think, by Deputy Aylward earlier, is fatalities. Like, I know you're in agricultural advice, but the farmers are your clients. And I read the report, and I know you have on page 51, and Dr. Jim Phelan has been active in this area, and I see health and safety. But I don't get a feel from this report that it's a significant priority for Chagas. And what I mean by that is, we know it's a priority, but I don't think it's an adequate priority. And straight away, um, you just say, <clears throat> on, on that page 51, uh, in 2017, a total of 24 people died in accidents on Irish farms, which was an increase um, over, uh, of three over 2016. And I think there's 16 or 17 farm deaths to date and you move straight away into the next sentence. Chagas works with a number of partners to promote health and safety among rural stakeholders. So straight away in your first paragraph when it comes to that issue, you're outsourcing a lot of the issue. And then I know you move on to health and safety. But I get the feel, even though everybody's concerned about it, I get the feel nobody owns dealing with the problem. Like, it's a health and safety issue. I think it's, if there's a farm debt, it's the health and safety issue authority doing the investigation wouldn't have been on it's not you that's correct so so i i get the feeling even though you're the people with the farmers on an ongoing basis 
those people in the Health and Safety Authority are responsible for health and safety and investigating farm accidents where there are deaths. And I do believe, and I've heard the debate this week in the Dáil, that there's a lot of agencies uh, actually involved in this, you know, between the different government departments can have a stake in, in, um, in the health and safety. I'm sure the Department of Agriculture has a role, you have some role, health and safety has a role. And I get the feel that nobody really takes full ownership of it. And I would have hoped it was you. I know when something goes wrong, you have a statutory body to investigate it. And, you know, you just touched on it a little bit. And you might give us a bit more information if you don't have it. The age, I know, we all know, none of us live in rural Ireland haven't met situations of an old man out on his own trying to do what he was doing and do the work of three people and he wasn't fit, able to do it and he shouldn't have been doing it. And then there's five-year-old kids running around to the back of the track, all tragic. But you might give us an age breakdown of all the deaths because... <clears throat> and then... In relation to the farms, I, and you've, you've said it yourself, and we all know it, but we're all talking about it, but not doing much about it. Because of um, a lot of younger people have, are, are working off the farm, we're now in the situation that I've met farmers. The, 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 I used to meet farmers a few years ago when they got the farm retirement scheme. They said they were never as well off because they never had as much money in their working lives. And then they got the farm retirement scheme. As I've said, a lot of them are really vulnerable. They're not, from, not viable. But now I'm finding the situation. I'm meeting farmers in their 70s. And they're telling me they're working harder now than they ever did because their sons are trying to hold down a, <clears throat> a day job. And you have 70-year-old farmers out on their own with big machines and big, tough animals out there. And I feel there is a growing risk, and it's, not, it's just a reflection <clears throat> of where we are in rural Ireland at the moment. And, like, and not just the age group of those people involved, but if you could give me how many of those were farming on their own at the time of the accident. And we've all heard tragic accidents that could be quite a lot of time might have elapsed before somebody spotted there was a problem. So. And really what I'm only asking is, I'm trying to spur you on to do more in this area, you know, um, and that's really where I'm coming at. And I just don't get it. I know you've trained your staff in relation to the events that you run. And like the question I just look at, um, and I know your people who go to the farms have had training in it, and you said the Chagas National Safety Conference took place in Clare in November, the keynote address by, by, by Professor Jim Finn. I'd love to know how many farmers have actually attended some of these events. You know, your staff and your consultants and the consultants who do reports for farmers and some farmers' organisations' representatives would be there. But I just... I think everyone in rural Ireland, you know, when, you know, we feel bad when these things happen. And we just feel, we look at... You know, farm accidents, I think, is the biggest section of um, fatalities, you know, in, in the workplace in Ireland. And it shouldn't be the case. You know, I think industry has been forced to take quite a step up and I don't think the farmers have. So look, at, I'm asking you to reflect and come back and give us a bit more information and I still feel nobody is specifically responsible. So you know what I'm saying there. That's probably a plea <laughs> from rural Ireland to help, which you know all about, but I still would like a greater emphasis on it. Now, <clears throat> anyone looking at your, at your financial statements and I just want to hone in on the financial statements. And I'm going to, I always ask a basic question when I don't understand something. And if I don't understand something, I'm quite sure I mightn't be alone in that. And, you, and it, you understand what it means. But like when I look at your accounts, and I see this heading, knowledge transfer. To the people who are watching this, it seems to be a very big source of income and expenditure significant part. You have um, income there, operations income, research income, or Octus grants, but knowledge transfer is a big in. Just explain to the people mm. okay. who don't know your financial system, what's that all about? Yeah. What does that heading mean? Well, it's an interesting point you raise uh, in the sense that we're so used to the terminology. Uh, the knowledge transfer activity in Chagas embraces two divisions, if you like. Our advisory activity where we have offices around the country is one branch, and we have a, a dedicated head of that activity. 
we have 284 advisors in the field, um, frontline advisors, uh, and then they're backed up by admin support and so on. And then the other branch is our education activity. In other words, the, the four Chagas colleges, all the teachers and the technicians and the farm staff uh, that are in those colleges, plus in recent years we've taken on uh, some contract lecturers because of the big growth in demand for part-time courses. So that's, that's essentially the activity. Now, uh, we, we generate income on both sides uh, because uh, the farm income there, as you can see, sorry, the advisory fee income last year was 11.8 million there in the accounts. And then I think the education was about five or six memory serves me right where did that show in the accounts just there i see page 93 that 18.9 million are refer operational income it's there certainly there somewhere because somebody who's page? familiar with the document page 93. page 93 yeah 93 i'm looking at note six yeah so i see the one point or the 18.9 million knowledge transfer operational income and then and there's you course fee income where's that under knowledge transfer the there. Of, uh, knowledge transfer it's five points something Oh yeah, course fee. Oh, it's part of that 18. Yeah. Oh, it's part of it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, like we, we have a variety of charges for all the courses. Um, we would have had about 7,000 students last year gone through Chagas. So uh, now they would be at courses of different durations, yes. both full time and part time. Yeah. So that's where that comes in. And then obviously there's associated expenditure. You know, we have uh, large numbers of staff and so on. Right. Just on that then, and. Like I'm just looking at the figures in front of me, and they, they don't make a great. I need a bit of help with them. That's all okay. I'm saying, so people can understand. I'm looking at your page 93 there, and you have operational income um, for knowledge transfer section at 18.9 million. Okay, that's what. And then I turn over the page to page 95, and I look at analysis of general operating expenses. And look at the knowledge transfer box, and it's 13.6 billion. Am I comparing like with like here? Yes. One is income, one is expenditure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm oh, on yeah, the same topic. Yes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then, <clears throat> and then. It excludes salaries, obviously. Oh well, then that's not an exact. Yeah. Okay. So you fill out the picture for me then. Yeah. Uh, well, the salaries. Um, we'd have to go. Where are the salaries? With the pay. Where's the, the pay associated with that? Pay bill there is on page 94. I see 31.19 million. So what's the pay associated with knowledge transfer? That's it there. The 31. Yes. Okay. Now that's again two categories: the advisors and the staff in the colleges. Um, okay. Because, like, really, what am I? Can you then just give send it on to us, right? Just a breakdown between the operational income for the knowledge transfer broke to, broken down, as, as you mentioned yourself, between advice and education. Oh, sorry, the yes, salaries, yes. And then, they, um, yeah, and, no, and, and then the expenditure is no, no, really, no, absolutely. Just to get a feel, yeah, yeah. because you're, you're, I think we've already mentioned early on, um, the, 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 your, your profit was down significantly. I will call it your operating surplus from approximately 8 million down to 5. I'm just trying to figure out in, in where in those divisions, operation, knowledge transfer, research, can you give a breakdown of where that, no, there's no problem. that um, reduction in profits occurred, as in income, salaries, apportion, yeah. and expenses, because you're down three million. Uh, um, you have to give me just a headline as over which divisions that loss occurred in, that the, the, the profit from eight, eight million in 16 down to five million, or do you want to send it on a schedule? You can see my obvious question. You're down three million. I'm looking at the breakdown of these headings, and I know the financial statement are right, but they don't show that kind of information as to where. Okay. Yeah. We, we had a substantial saving. You probably have, uh, yeah. In, obviously, in 2016, I mean, we, were, we managed to squirrel away resources right across the organisation, but we can certainly allocate that to the diff, to the education and advisory. Yeah, and I know I'm not querying the figure, but I'm just saying, as somebody who's not, yeah, yeah. is internally familiar with the. As I said at the beginning, are, like just, we, we like normally, that. we wouldn't want to have any surplus. So we have to hit the the balance budget on the sixpence on the 31st of December. I mean, that's the normal. But in recent years, we've had to build up a reserve, and some years it's not. Well, possible. that's probably what. So some people would 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 feel then that. Um, 
um, the farmers aren't fully benefiting to the income if you're in a drive to increase your, your profit well, out of your activity when you're meant to be in a break-even situation. Yeah, well, the, it's not, the, the point is... You, uh, you understand what people... Yeah, sure, understand. but we have to be a prudent chairman in terms yeah. of managing our cash no, flow. I know that. Just on, on pay, so you, you can send... Yes, a, absolutely. A, I call it a breakdown that the non-Chagas person yeah. can understand. I'll just put it that way, right? Um, on page 95, then, again, up on line 3, you have rents, rates and insurance. Where are you renting? There's some situation you rent some premises. What's, you know, and I don't know... Is that land? Well, there's, there's rates and insurance, but is there yeah. much rent? Just yes, give us the breakdown premises. of the rent yes. in the premises yeah. location. We, we would Where rent rent? both land and some premises. Right. So you can send us on a schedule oh, of yeah. what's your it's rent. No problem, yeah. yeah. And why would you be renting land if you have 1,800 hectares? Well, it, it, for example, if you take Moor Park now, um, uh, we, we own a small amount, we own a core amount around the facility itself. And uh, it's really programme driven. For instance, we've rented land from Dairy Gold because we're rolling out there a whole new programme around the next generation dairy herd plus tr precision farming. So it's programme driven. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, we fund that activity from a variety of sources. A lot of the time we would generate research income mm. that enables us to take on a new programme. So that's, that's often the driver. Um, sometimes, uh, look, we, we're very, very careful about the land we rent. And it's a question I would continuously ask you know, when there's a proposal. There hasn't been one now in a long time in recent years. Um, and, uh, you know, when we get the opportunity, if if it's program, everything has to be program driven. If it makes sense, we'll rent it. Yeah. Okay. If now offices any... again, uh, we own most of our host offices, but again, it depends. If there's a, an area where we have an office that, uh, or we think we need an office, and uh, it makes more sense to rent it rather than commit to a new build. Yeah. I just noticed, and I'm not going into the detail of it, an unusual situation that I haven't seen too often before, where you have kind of deferred income. I get the impression that if, and I'm trying to put it simply because I've only had a quick look at this, that if Enterprise Ireland gives you a grant of a couple of million to do a job, if you do the job, the income is recorded in the year. If they give you the three million and you lodge it in your bank account, um, but you have to do the work the following year, you hold it in deferred income, it doesn't yes. come into the current income, and it's used, recorded as income in the year you incur the expenditure. Yes. Why would anyone be paying you up front to do work it's, that you have to hold it in? I suppose it's, it's the typical way in which uh, research is funded because... The same in third level institutions. Yeah, the very same with UCD or UCC or any of the... Because the, the programmes are multi-annual, so you, get a certain, you don't get it all. Okay. You get a certain amount up front. Obviously you have to have resources to start the job. Okay. And then the problem usually lies at the other end, because when we finish the project then and we invoice, it can take a long, long time to get the balance of the monies. Okay. So it's just the way it's... it's yeah, so sometimes some of these might be part of, it's not just a one-year issue. Oh, no, they'll be all multi-annual. It's a rolling, rolling issue. Multi-annual. Your typical yeah. research project would could be, be could be three to four years. Okay. And the other side of that, Chairman, is the other uh, component would be, like, when we commit to, we can only commit to uh, capital investment if the resources are in place, yeah. right? So therefore, obviously, with capital funds, um, I think there's about six million of that 20 million there, odd million is, is, is where we've, we've commitments to build infrastructure over a period of time. Right. The money has to be in place. So you have the, the cash. We have to have it. You have the cash in hand. Uh, uh, from when we, and that's key requirement of the permission to proceed with, uh, one of the key requirements to proceed with uh, infrastructural development. Just talk to me about taxation. Um, you made five million previous year, you made eight million. How much corporation tax or income tax? What did don't. you actually pay? What? Susan. Yeah, because, um, you know, you're out there earning, I know a lot of your money is exchequer grant and I yeah. don't know whether that's deemed to be exempt it's, income from yeah. that. I don't know, but you have other income as you, you said yourself. Yeah. Um, Chagas has a charitable status, so we don't actually, we're not actually liable to uh, income tax. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, so there is a small element of taxation, and that would be uh, attributable to the subsidiary company Moorpark Technology Limited. So that's uh, run on a commercial basis, and the profits that they generate are uh, subject to corporation tax. 
but uh, Chogos itself has um, charitable status from the Revenue Commissioners and doesn't pay income tax. Now, we're, we're subject to all of the, you know, the and payroll PLA, tax and VAT and all of those other things, but just not tax on profits. But um, as has been discussed here already, we're not actually you're in the profit-making business anyway, so year on year, you know, it balances out over time. We don't build up surpluses and uh, we're not um, but, subject to... But then explain why is there some big figure in there somewhere of 110 million deferred tax if you're going to tell me you don't ever pay tax. You know, it's, yeah. on, it's on page 110, deferred tax. You've, uh, you've provided for 110 million and no 22 provision for liabilities deferred tax. If you're never liable for tax, why that's, use that provision in there? Um, that's uh, yeah, 110,000, and um, you'll see that. Oh, 110,000. Sorry, that's a small figure. Yeah, and Chairman, you'll see that's on the more park group. facility. Yeah. yeah, it's the more park. Uh, okay, and just okay. and I just want to ask you actually on the Moore Park issue. Um, just bear with me a moment. I saw, I seen your note somewhere. You have a 57% shareholding yes. in. Okay, note 14, 106. I just don't get how the two of these work together. Uh, investments. Actually, on the investments, I understand what Deputy Burke said about might, you might have a conflict of interest with shareholding in the co-ops and 438. Uh, the 438,000, half a million, it's not major. You can always sell your shares, let's be clear. Anyone in rural Ireland, farmers can get shares, sure. they're entitled to sell them if they want. What I found unusual was that was, did it show a bias to the dairy industry, as opposed to, I don't see any shares in any of the meat processing, but I know you say you got the shares just because you were a Yeah, buyer. it doesn't arise in yeah. the case of, uh, and we, we would sell, uh, sell animals to the markets. And so yeah, on. and funny, when I saw that, I actually read it, I said, oh, you only have shares in the dairy industry, but I think we've dealt with that. But um, just o over the page then, you say Chagas has invested 650 in Moore Park Technology Limited and has a 57% holding in the paid-up share capital of that com company. Wh who's the other 43%? Pardon? The other 43% is in um, Moore Park Technology Limited was set up in the early 1990s, yeah. and it was a collaboration between ourselves and the dairy industry. Not all of the dairy industry had uh, joined up and uh, were involved in the shareholding or, or contributed to the equity of the company at the time. I think as well in the, year, in the first tranche um, uh, of activity, um, Enterprise Ireland, I think, were involved as well. Uh, now, in recent years, we've actually we've sought additional investment of 10 million to upgrade the facilities for Brexit and everything else. Um, and Enterprise Ireland dropped out. They're not currently shareholders. So, who are the 43 percent shareholders? Well, it's all the, the dairy companies. Uh, most yeah. of the dairy companies, the likes of Glanbia, the likes of Dairy Gold, the Co-ops, Dairy yeah. Gold, Kerry. Um, temporary Co-op, uh, Aravon, yeah. yeah, Arivo, I think, Arivo there. There's one or two of them that are not there, and I, I don't want to... No, it doesn't matter. They're small. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. A small yeah, amount. Yeah, yeah. But then I go on to page 110, no, 25, and says non-controlling non interest, and says the non-controlling interest comprise shares in Moore Park Technology Limited. I don't get how you have a 57% controlling shareholding on note 14, and then you have a non-controlling interest in no 25. Um, Chairman, um, I'll answer that question. So in our consolidated uh, statement of income and expenditure on uh, page 80, um, that's the combined results for Chagas and Moore Park Technology. At the bottom of that statement, it says surplus attributable to Chagas uh, 2.28 million and attributable to non-controlling interest 118 so um, no 25 then that you refer to on 110 is explaining that the non-controlling interest is more park technology limited so what it's explaining is that the amount of the surplus there that's not Chagask is MTL the non-controlling so interest yeah so we've only one subsidiary 
it's MTL and the um, financial reporting standards require that terminology, uh, non-controlling interest, but basically it's uh, the amount that's not attributable to Chagas itself. Okay, so... Yeah, it's undistributed. Uh, yeah. I, undistributed. Uh, okay, I understand. Yeah. I, just, I, had, I thought that when you said you have 57%, with this note, no 25 doesn't relate to that 57 percent is related to the 43 percent. Exactly. Yeah. That's the same company. The same right? That's when I saw the same company, I didn't yeah. under. So that's the 43 percent. Yeah, the accounting right. standards are fairly prescriptive about certain matters, and this is one of them. Right. Okay, let me, just near, nearly there now. I don't know, have I anything else to particularly... Yeah, I um, think it's really the, the last point or two. Um, I mentioned the deferred income, which you've explained, and the taxation issue, and then the controlling interest in other the county side. And the last issue then is, is I suppose, about Johnstown Castle, the building. And I see on um, page 13, heritage assets. Most of your assets you have in there are costs. But like, um, I suppose, there's a great lot of reserve accounting in there. You have an awful lot of assets that you don't include because they're heritage assets, and you're saying you couldn't be impossible to get an objective valuation of worth of them, you know, in a comparable basis. Um, so I'm right in saying the whole Johnstown is it just the building or the land? What's included in your assets in respect to Johnstown? Chairman, can I ask uh, yeah. the CEO to deal with that yeah. because he's directly responsible for the current development project on yeah. the site? Yeah. <clears throat> um, Johnstown comprises about 950 um, acres of land, that's the estate, um, but within the estate there's uh, about 120 acres of gardens and lakes there um, and a castle and they, uh, they, they were um, part of the condition under which they were passed over to the state was that uh, we couldn't use them or for any other purposes. Um, so, uh, other than for what part? Uh, well, for the, agricultural the, 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 research castle, the castle initially was transferred to the state for agricultural uh, purposes. Right. Um, and we built new facilities in the uh, 2000s, and the castle became surplus to requirements. So we have the castle and we have the gardens, and we have to maintain them as part of the, tran the agreement of transfer to the state. So uh, we do, we occupy other purpose-built laboratories and offices now on the estate, as do the Department of Agriculture and the, uh, and the EPA. And uh, we do farm, actively farm uh, the balance of the, la the land. Uh, for, we use it for the research purposes. When was that bequeathed to the estate? Around 1945. Yeah. As far back as that? Yeah. And, and in relation to the castle itself? Yeah. It's coincidental, I just happened to be there last during the summer, coincidentally, and had a beautiful walk with the garden, the lovely trees, and the trees kind of hanging in over lakes, and but the, they're fantastic. I was, my first time there. But the, the one thing that little saddened me, I looked at the castle, and went up, and as you know, you can walk right up and look in the windows. It looked very shabby on the inside, there's almost there was some of the floorboards not in great nick. I, I, well, didn't, uh, I, I didn't even... Do, do, do the ground. Uh, uh, We're doing nothing, only a couple of people to tackle. Well, and I accept there's a major renovation oh, yeah. possible required, and that's almost beyond no, the scope. That's, that's of ongoing, it's Chairman. Underway, Chairman. Yeah. Right, so work has, work has started since it was there. It's a seven and a half million program yeah. underway. On the building. Yes. Yeah. We have and a joint program between the Department of Agriculture and Fulcher Ireland have committed funds to a program. Uh, we're renovating the castle and we're building a visitor centre. Uh, yeah, in, it's in the, in the grounds. And the rest of it so on, we would yeah. hope to have the castle renovated and open to the public internally, as, obviously, as well as the grounds. Uh, we'd hope to have that open to the public by um, April 2019. Next year, because yeah. right, when I was there, I read about the plans, but I looked a bit sad. I was obviously there just before the work started, which, which is fantastic. And is much of that coming out of your resort? Because it is a national asset, you know. Well, we, we, as, as we, but there was special funds set aside. Um, by the Department of Agriculture, capital fund of five million. Okay. Plus, we uh, we sought additional funding from Board Falsha because of the tourism nature of the project. 
There's also a, the National Agricultural Museum is located outside, there. Yeah. and they're involved in the project along with the Irish Heritage. And do you have to put much of Chagas money into it, or very little? No. Well, it is Chagas money in the sense that it comes through uh, our vote. Uh, yeah, the, the yeah. five million. But especially, but it's not drawing on your resources for your key. We, we sorry, uh, we have a commitment to fund. Um, obviously, we have had a long-standing commitment over several years to maintain the house in good order, yeah. and uh, we've and also we have subvented the uh, agricultural museum. Yeah. And we've committed to, to to continue that for ten years, isn't it? Yes. The arrangement um, when the visitor centre and the castle have been. Um, repaired uh, and the visitor centre developed, the arrangement is that we will enter into an operations agreement with the Irish Heritage Trust for 10 years, so we'll pass it over to them and they will operate it. Um, unfortunately, um, these historic buildings never really generate money, they consume far more money than they generate, so Chagas has agreed um, to subvent it with a uh, subsidy in the region of 300,000 per year, uh, but on a sl sliding scale, so 300,000 from year one, sliding uh, hopefully down to a very small amount in year 10. Yeah. But, Chairman, it's important, we, we have been incurring that expenditure historically. In keeping it? Yeah, and also in, in subventing the operation of the museum, so we, we've, it yeah. was reasonable to continue it on a sliding scale. I know, scale. look, at it, it's great. Yeah. I know it's there's a cost in keeping it there, but like at the same time, there's a value. I know it's there's a value to the taxpayer to have a facility like that in the place. I, may, I just make yeah. that point. We, we have two other heritage buildings, and uh, the same issue arises, Chairman. Yeah. In, in Which one are those? We have uh, well, uh, Oak Park House. Yeah. And 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 uh, Bally Hayes. Right. Okay. Okay. And I, sorry, Kildalton. I should of course. Kildalton. Yes, okay. Kildalton. Look at we played a little bit into heritage and other matters, but it's got to do with um, your property, so it's, that's why I just went there. So look, at, at this stage, I'm on my own, so we're completed, and I want to thank you all for coming here. The, uh, Mr. Smith got off light today, the Department of Agriculture, so um, that's the way the meeting went, and we're very happy to meet. I think it's about 10 years since Chagas were here. Um, um, the only reason you were here is early on in the year we said, what large state funded organisations are out there that haven't been here in quite a while. There was no other agenda, only just a matter of routine um, because we hadn't met with Chagas at the PSE. In the, and you can see the tone of the questions. It was very non controversial towards, or non confrontational towards many another meeting here. So take that as good. So look at this stage, I want to thank the witnesses from Chagas and the Department of Agriculture and the CNAG and his staff uh, for attending here today. The meeting is now adjourned until Thursday next, the 11th of October, when we will be meeting with the Office of Public Works. Thank you.